National Park Service operations. Thursday, a pair of House subcommittees met to review the financial management in the Park Service and its reorganization plan. Lawmakers are interested in how the Park Service and its parent agency, the Interior Department, are proposing the service's designation system. In the past, some parks have been sanctioned through appropriations instead of following the normal process. The park system currently includes preserves, monuments, historic sites, seashores, and battlefields. The Interior Department, Park Service, and General Accounting Office officials testify. meeting uh, to order. It's uh, 10 o'clock. We appreciate you being here. This is a joint meeting of the authorizing National Park Forest and Land Subcommittee and the Subcommittee on Interior and Related Agencies Appropriations Subcommittee. We welcome our witnesses here. I'll turn to my colleague uh, from Ohio, the chairman of the uh, Appropriation Subcommittee, Mr. Regula. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, let me say this is uh, historic. Uh, I think it's a unique experiment in the sense of having the authorizing and the uh, Appropriations Committee have a joint hearing, but uh, we share a common responsibility and uh, certainly offers an opportunity to hear uh, from these witnesses and uh, matters that affect to both committees. Uh, let me begin by saying that I believe the Park Service and the land management agencies in general are made up of some of the most dedicated employees in government. Today I think we will talk some about accountability and management. I'm, for all, I'm all for good management. What the election was about in November was not eliminating government but making it more efficient, more effective, and making it work better for people. And in that context I think it is a appropriate to discuss the mission and management of all government agencies, including the Park Service. I'm not persuaded that we can or should establish one cookie-cutter cutter recipe to manage all the national parks. The units of the park system are diverse. They run the gamut from the crown jewels of Yellowstone, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon to our newer urban recreation areas such as Gateway, Golden Gate, and Cuyahoga and historic sites and monuments such as Tuskegee, Palo Alto, Alto Battlefield, the system's smallest unit, that is Kakisco National Memorial in Philadelphia, our national lake shores and seashores, including Cape Cod and Canaveral. Each has a diverse, diverse mission and each has different challenges, and I think it would be a mistake, if not impossible, to establish a uniform approach to management. In my view, it is incumbent upon the Park Service to empower their superintendents to manage these units efficiently and effectively to meet the needs of the individual park as well as the needs of the Park Service as a whole and, most importantly, the needs of the American people whom we all serve. It's been my experience that they do, and I'm not aware uh, of any $600 ashtray stories about the Park Service. Today, we'll get an opportunity to hear what you, Director Kennedy, believe are the challenges facing the Park Service and specifically how you plan to address those in the months ahead. And we're, of course, challenged with the growing popularity of the parks. Uh, as I understand, visitation was up 10 percent last year, and I think that will be a continuing pattern. So uh, we appreciate the witnesses coming and appreciate your hosting our joint uh, meeting here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Regular. I don't see uh, Mr. Livingston here. Is he? Uh, no, I. So he I may be. I'll do my opening statement at this okay. time. Okay. 
Uh, I think that we are all here today because we love the National Park Service and or because the National Park Service is very important to our constituents. Those of us who have followed the plight of the National Park Service in recent years have watched as parks have fallen into disrepair and essential visitors' needs have gone unmet. We know there is a daunting task in front of us, a task which is going to take the combined effort of all of us if we are going to rescue this agency. While Congress must take some of the responsibility for piling so many new parks and other federal mandates on the agency's plate, the amount of financial support the agency has received from the Congress is really commendable. In the last 12 years, the Appropriation Committee has more than doubled the operating budget of the National Park Service, yet we don't seem to be making any real progress on the backlogs in park operation, land acquisition, or construction. In 1991, the National Park Service reported to Congress an operational backlog of $377 million. Four years later, after Congress has increased the National Park Service operating budget by $308 million, the reported backlog has gone as more than double to $846 million. I don't understand why the goalposts keep moving back. I'm even more concerned when the Interior Inspector General reports that the National Park Service cannot balance its books or when the GAO reports that the National Park Service is not spending its funds in the manner directed by Congress and cannot verify the accuracy of its backlog estimates. There are also significant questions about how the National Park Service is spending tens of millions of dollars in special non-appropriated funds. However, in my mind, this is not an issue of the National Park Service financial system. Rather, it's clear, clearly an issue of management accountability. I'm really amazed in my terms and years here in Congress that we can't learn to live within our income. I often think of my grandmother who used to always say, fix it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. As corny as that may sound, I think that should almost be the slogan for most of our people who work in the government. I intend to make the restoration of the Park Service a top priority of my chairmanship. However, these are not problems which Congress can solve alone. We will need the National Park Service to account for every nickel it receives, to work with us to establish some reasonable goals of what can be accomplished within the limited financial resources available, and then to work together with us to accomplish these goals. I look forward to our hearings today as we step as a first step in achieving an understanding which will allow us to make progress in that direction. I want to thank the witnesses and members for their participation today. Mr. Chairman? I, uh, yes, I see that our ranking minority member, Mr. Yates, is not here. I guess yours is not. And neither is our neither. ranking minority member, uh, Mr. Richardson. Yeah. And neither is Mr. Livingston. So should we go to the witnesses and I think so. we come back? Right. So I think we're ready to hear from our witnesses. Uh, the order is uh, the GAO, the IG, the National Parks and Conservation Association, and Director Kennedy with Assistant Secretary Frampton and Bruce Schaefer. What w our plan is that we will hear from all the witnesses and then uh, we'll open it to questions from the members of both panels, uh, both subcommittees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is <clears throat> James Duffus, and I am the Director of Natural Resources Management in the General Accounting Office. Okay. Members of the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss efforts by the National Park Service to improve its financial and program data, internal controls, and performance measures, and to restructure its organization. Our work has raised two basic concerns about the Park Service. First, the Park Service does not have adequate financial and program data and internal controls to know, one, the nature and extent of many problems relating to the resources it is responsible for fostering, protecting, and preserving. Secondly, the effectiveness of measures taken to deal with the problems. And thirdly, where the limited resources should be allocated to do the most good. This is particularly important given the highly decentralized nature of the Park Service and the autonomy of the individual unit managers. Second, while the Park Service's restructuring plan addresses some of the problems currently facing the agency, such as the need to meet the demands of an expanding system, higher visitor use, and more increasing complex resource protection problems, the plan does not address the potential to improve operations through a collaborative federal approach to land management involving Interior's three land management agencies and the Forest Service. It also does not address the function and programs which could be eliminated 
or turned over to state and local governments or the private sector. Time and again, our work has shown, as well as the work of Interior's Inspector General, that the service lacks the necessary financial and program data, internal controls, and performance measures needed to effectively manage the agency. For example, accompanying the growth in units and visitor use is a growing backlog or shortfall of deferred maintenance and reconstruction needs cited by park managers compared to the funds that are available to meet these needs. Estimates of the shortfall range from about $2 billion to over $4 billion and include everything from unmowed grass and peeling paint to collapsed structures and closed hiking trails. Some park managers report that the deterioration of some assets, including historical buildings, is so advanced that if not repaired or maintained soon, they may be lost for future generations. However, our work has raised questions concerning the validity of the data on which the estimates are based and the accountability for the funds appropriated. For example, employee housing needs are included in the backlog estimate. We could not, however, verify the accuracy of the Park Service's $546 million estimate for employee housing repair and replacement. Park Service headquarters had not provided guidance to regional offices and park units on how to prepare their estimates. And at 17 parks we reviewed, officials generally could not support them and in some cases did not know how they were derived. Our work has also shown that the Park Service lacks basic information on such issues as concessionaire operations, threats to parks, and the condition of its natural and cultural resources. In addition, the Park Service does not have internal controls that provide adequate assurance that funds are used in the most cost-effective manner. For example, in a February 1992 report on maintenance of the National Park System, Interior's Inspector General stated that maintenance funds were being used for administrative and non-maintenance purposes and that the service did not properly account for its revenues. The September 1994 report by the IG states that the service had not effectively implemented recommendations in prior IG reports relating to such weaknesses as effective controls over cash receipts and disbursements of property, plant and equipment, nor could it ensure the budgeted funds were adequately tracked and controlled. On the basis of the IG's recommendation, Interior reported in, Department in, 19, in December of 1994 that the Park Service, together with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, were the only two agencies for which it could not provide reasonable assurance concerning the, the integrity of their systems of management, accounting, and administrative control. Good baseline data and controls are prerequisites for developing effective performance measures to improve accountability and stewardship and to lower costs by focusing on results. In a 1984 report, we concluded that the Park Service did not have a system to plan, organize, direct, and review its maintenance activities, and therefore could not assure that its assets received needed upkeep and that park maintenance activities were efficient and effective. While now, a decade later, they have developed a system for tracking maintenance activities at the park level. It is not reliable and is not used by Park Service officials to track progress. Under the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993, the Park Service's efforts will need to be reflected in Interior's annual performance plan beginning with fiscal year 1999. For a given funding level, specific results are expected. Actual program results could then be compared with established goals. For example, a national park may be allocated maintenance funds with the understanding that an established program of work will be accomplished so that conditions will be retained at or brought up to standard. Park superintendents would be held accountable for completing the work. However, the Park Service will not be able to implement a performance measurement system until it develops baseline data and controls. I'd like to turn now briefly to the Park Service's restructuring uh, and reorganization efforts. To meet the goals of the National Performance Review, or NPR, as well as other administrative st administration streamlining directives and legislative mandates, Interior asked each of its agencies, including the Park Service, to review their organizations and identify strategies to reduce layers, increase supervisor span of control, and reduce headquarters functions while protecting employees who deliver services directly to Interior's customers. The restructuring plan for the Park Service places more personnel and funding in the field, 
closer to the resources and customers being served. The plan will be implemented over the next four fiscal years at a still to be determined cost. We believe that the Park Service plan should result in some improvements. However, we have two basic concerns. First, the Park Service's proposed restructuring plan addresses only the efficiency and effectiveness to be a drive derived from the sharing of resources within the agency. The plan does not address similar benefits that could be derived from co-locating or combining various functions with the other three federal land management agencies. In contrast, the Forest Service has proposed to collate its regional offices with those of another agriculture agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. In addition, the Forest Service's December 1994 reinvention report emphasizes co-location with other government agencies as a means of streamlining, sharing resources, and saving rental costs. Second, to comply with the second phase of the administration's NPR initiative, the Park Service is only now being tasked to identify the functions and programs that it could terminate, privatize, or devolve to state or local governments. We believe that any effort to reinvent or downsize government needs to ask the basic question, what can and should the federal government do? However, because this question is only now being asked, the Park Service needs to recognize that this exercise could result in substantial changes to its functions and programs, and it must ensure that its planned restructuring is capable of accommodating such changes. In summary, Mr. Chairman, we have the following observations. First, the Park Service is capable of generating additional revenues. For example, the Congress is considering giving the Park Service more discretion to increase entrance and user fees and reform its concessions policy and to direct at least a portion of the increased revenues back to the units that generated them. We believe, however, that such discretion and flexibility in the use of federal funds must be accompanied by improved accountability and stewardship. This would include implementation of long recommended improvements in the service's financial and program data and internal controls. Once these improvements are implemented, measurable performance goals can be established and performance indicators to measure accomplishments can be developed on which to lower costs by focusing on results. Second, we believe that the current fiscal climate demands that the Park Service and other federal land management agencies work together to reduce costs, increase efficiency, and improve service to the public. Toward this end, we believe that the Park Service needs to work closely with the Congress and other federal land management agencies to develop a coordinated interagency strategy to link Park Service reforms to reforms being proposed by the other agencies. Finally, we believe that the Park Service's restructuring plan must ultimately incorporate the results of a thorough sorting out of the functions and programs that are and are essential and are not essential to its mission. That concludes my summary statement, Mr. Chairman, and I would request that my detailed statement be uh, submitted in the record. Without objection, the statement will be made a part of the record. We thank you, and next we'll hear from the Inspector General. Good morning, Chairman Hanson, Chairman Regula, members of the subcommittees. My name is Joyce Fleischman. I am the Deputy Inspector General at the Department of the Interior. I have a fairly detailed statement this morning, which I would like to have read into the record. Without objection, it will be made part Thank of the you, record. Thank you, sir. I'd like to talk to you today fairly briefly about the results of our audits with respect to the financial management of the National Park Service and with respect to the area that most of us refer to as maintenance activities, a normal, everyday part of Park Service work. We'd like to talk about maintenance as an example, if you will, of how financial management is tied to and is inextricably a part of day-to-day -day operations of any entity and certainly the National Park Service. Most recently, we have completed a required audit, audit under the Chief Financial Officers Act. And that audit is of a financial statement of the National Park Service. This is the third time that we have attempted to audit a financial statement produced by the National Park Service. It is the third time that we have been unable to produce, to audit that statement. The reason for that is the lack, fundamental lack of accounting data to back up what they say in their financial statement. 
Overall, the, the information contained in the financial statements that we have reviewed is not accurate, reliable, or supported by the accounting system in the National Park Service. We, we believe that fundamentally this is due to a lack of commitment in the past by National Park Service to, excuse me, to place a sufficiently high priority on management controls and accurate financial data. Consequently, simple accounting errors are not detected or not detected or corrected. And the usefulness of financial data for purposes, general purposes of management, such as planning, budgeting for routine operations, was lost. Some examples of the inaccurate accounting and the consequences thereof include, on the financial statement, the Park Service listed $6.6 .6 billion worth of assets and $68 million for liabilities. There's insufficient data to back up those numbers. And frankly, until the Park Service can accurately account for what it owns and what it owes, it cannot adequately plan for the use of its resources to accomplish its mission and goals. The, Nash, the, the Park Service's financial statement for 94, 93, I'm sorry, included a, a number of $73 million balance in one receivable account. That number did not have sufficient data in the accounting system to indicate accuracy. Without adequate records, the Park Service will not be able to determine what it is owed and to bill appropriately for those debts. While there may, one thing I'd like to emphasize, while there may seem to be, these seem to be simple accounting errors that have no relevance to the day-to-day -day operation of the National Park Service or the individual parks, they represent a fundamental lack of sound, accurate financial data that is essential to any, any entity, be it an individual family or a major enterprise, to carry out its affairs responsibly. Such information as how much money you have, how much money you, you have spent, or how much money you are owed, if any, and how much it will take for short and long-term operations is absolutely essential to any operation. The Park Service is no different in this respect than any other enterprise. We have noted over the years in a number of audits additional examples of weak financial management in the Park Service. First of all, I'd like to emphasize that we have noted that the Park Service has developed a standardized accounting system. This is the Department of Interior standardized accounting system, which is used throughout the bureaus and agencies that make up the department. The Park Service, however, when it implemented this system, did not include a full transfer of all data from its previous accounting system into that one. So in effect, what you had is bad data and insufficient data going into a new automated accounting system. Further, we, we learned when we reviewed their implementation that the system was not implemented to, to fully implement, utilize certain features, automatic uh, processing features. The data remains uncorrected, and the system is not fully implemented at this, at this point. Until they do that, they will be unable to produce either an auditable financial statement or to fully use the system and financial data in its day-to-day -day operations. We've also looked at their accounting for personal property. We reported in our report on that audit that some 16,000 property items valued at over $27 million may be lost, missing, or not verifiable because the Park Service does not have and has not implemented adequate <coughs> property control procedures. Property values were overstated by more than $90 million because the Park Service had not ensured that the data maintained in its personal property accounting system were accurate. Examples of this included a vacuum cleaner that's worth approximately $150 was listed at over $800,000 in value. A dishwasher that cost $350 was listed at over $700,000. We've also looked at how the National Park Service monitors special accounts that are established by the concessioners. These special accounts are established so that the concessioners can deposit or set aside funds in lieu of paying certain franchise fees. In 1992, concessioners in 20 parks deposited over $13 million in these special accounts. 
At one park that we looked at, just to give you an example, we found no documentation to, to support the expenditure of a million dollars, although the contract between the concessioner and the National Park Service specifies that the Park Service is to certify actual expenditures from the invoices submitted by the concessioner. <laughs> As you know, the Park Service in some instances also collects user fees. We have found that they did not adequately account from expenditures made from these revenues. Public Law 100-203 allows the Park Service to retain entrance fees and user fees collected for expenditures on legislatively pre prescribed items. This legislation requires that fee program revenues be deposited in a special United States Treasury account the year that they are collected and be available for distribution to the park units the following year for certain uses. Those example, are, examples of those uses include resource protection, research, interpretation, maintenance activities related to resource protection. The Park Service, however, allowed the parks to individual parks to expend the fee program revenues in the same manner as annual operating appropriations. Because they commingled these, these monies, neither we nor the Park Service can determine whether those revenues were expended for the purposes intended by the Congress. And to give you some idea of how much money we're talking about, in 1988 and 89, respectively, $50.3 million and $51.4 million were depart deposited in the special U.S. Treasury account that I mentioned earlier. I have to emphasize also that many of the recommendations that we have, we have made to the National Park Service in the past as a result of these audits are, being in, are in the process of being implemented. But we remain concerned, however, about the accuracy of data and the, and the soundness of financial management in the National Park Service, particularly based on, on audits that we are, are doing now under the Chief Financial Office, uh, Officers Act. The latest attempt to audit that statement, as I told you earlier, resulted in a report that we are unable to audit the statement. What that means to us is that there are continuing problems with respect to financial management in the Park Service. Until the Park Service corrects these problems, until they fully account for and accurate data, the funds that they are receiving and the expenditures of those funds, we don't believe they will be, they will be able to adequately plan for and use their resources. As I indicated earlier, financial management is part and parcel of overall management of any entity. Both short-term and long-term planning, all expenditures of funds, all operations. An example of this that we have found in the National Park Service is, that, as I said earlier, the day-to-day -day operation of maintenance of the facilities and resources. While not the sole cause of the service's backlog of maintenance work, inadequate financial management over the years has certainly added to the problem and contributed to the growth of the backlog that they now have. We have identified some examples of inadequate financial management planning in audits that were specifically directed at maintenance activities in the National Park Service in the past. Such factors include spending money, uh, maintenance funds for non-maintenance activities, inadequate request for funds to, to maintain maintenance projects, an under-assessment of park concessioners and other non-governmental recipients for maintenance work. Each of these problems impairs the Park Service's ability to identify and obtain resources necessary to provide maintenance of park facilities. Park Service officials themselves have told us in the course of our audits, for example, that under the line item construction appropriation, the Park Service constructs new f facilities without obtaining corresponding maintenance funds or resources to operate and maintain them. In addition, concessioner special funds, that is, capital improvement and maintenance set-asides at, at certain parks, has resulted in additional facilities being added to the inventory at a time when parks are having difficulty taking care of existing facilities. Additionally, Park Service officials have told us that new facilities are sometimes constructed at some parks by using leftover materials from other projects and money from the Park Service's operational maintenance funds. While new facilities are needed, 
We believe that they, are, they were constructed at the expense of having other maintenance needs deferred and that these will ultimately result, result in an increase at the maintenance, of the maintenance burden at these particular parks. In addition, we have identified two internal management practices that hinder the service's ability to administer an effective preventive maintenance program. These factors are the use of regional program maintenance funds for headquarters and regional office administrative expenses such as space, telephones, and other unexpected or unfunded costs, and for non-maintenance purposes such as construction activities and major equipment purchases. For example, $10 million of the $269 million received by the Park Service for maintenance in fiscal year 1989 was reprogrammed for non-maintenance purposes such as administrative cost. $2.6 million of its fiscal year 1990 maintenance funds was used to pay the District of Columbia for water and sewer charges. Yellowstone National Park used fiscal year 1989 cyclic maintenance funds to help fund the construction of new employee housing that cost about $1.3 million. As a result of these diversions, funds available for park operational maintenance purposes were reduced, while regional cyclic and repair and rehabilitation maintenance projects were postponed or canceled. The availability of, of maintenance funds were further eroded because the Park Service did not adequately assess and recover costs for maintenance and other improvements that directly benefit park concessioners and other non-governmental recipients. For example, in Sequoia National Park, the Park Service spent $120,000 for work in the giant forest area to replace the water collection distribution system, to repair the sewer system, and to replace the water valve boxes. These are repairs that should have been the concessioners' responsibilities. In another audit, we learned that the Park Service had not adequately pursued cost recovery recovery of approximately $71 million spent on capital investments for utility services from concessioners and inholders at national parks and other sites. For example, Grand Canyon National Park had not pursued cost sharing for utility capital investments totaling $20 million. These funds were expended for water system modifications and wastewater treatment facilities. The concessioners' use of these facilities was approximately 80 and 84 percent, respectively. I'd further like to emphasize that in response to the recommendations that we have made in all of these audit reports, the Park Service has agreed with us that additional funding is required and that it would, through improved management and planning, fully document their needs and submit budget requests that reflect those needs with respect to other service-wide priorities. The Service has also agreed that it would place greater emphasis on budget integrity by requiring regions and parks to secure appropriate pr approval before expending funds for purposes other than those for which the money was allotted. The Park Service has also agreed with the IG that it will pursue the recovery of maintenance costs and cost sharing for capital investment for utility systems that have benefited concessions. In summary, we need to note that in each of our audits per pertaining to ma maintenance and other operational functions as well, we have noted a recurring theme of how inadequate financial management impairs the service's ability to carry out its activities. Although we recognize that there are other factors that continue to impact the Park Service's ability, for example, to reduce its maintenance backlog, such as insufficient funding and increased visitation, we believe that improved financial management practices would alleviate some of the financial pressures today. In summary, improved financial management will go far beyond <laughs> enabling the Park Service to produce auditable financial statements. We believe that improvements in financial management would enable the Park Service to accomplish its goals and its mission, including maintenance activities, in a more efficient and effective manner. We further believe that improved financial management will enable the Park Service to better support requests for additional funding and to explain how appropriate revenues and monies have been spent. That concludes my statement. I would be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you. And next we'll hear from the uh, National Parks and Conservation Association unanimous cons with unanimous consent. Your State, your full statement will be made part of the record.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Regular, Mr. Hansen, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Bill Chandler. I am representing the National Parks and Conservation Association. For those new members of the committee who may not be familiar with this organization, it is a 501c3 nonprofit citizens organization representing people around the country, over 450,000 members who are interested in enhancing, maintaining, and protecting a world-class national park system. Uh, the National Park Service is going through some very wrenching changes these days, downsizing, belt tightening, and even possible rescissions. Clearly, new policies and management strategies are needed to enable the Park Service to be more effective and to uh, be more responsive to its clients, the American public. We believe this move to reinvent the Park Service is healthy, and we simply urge these committees to proceed in ways that maintain a first-class park system. That, we believe, is what the public wants. They are very much aware of the problems that plague the park system now, and we know that they want them corrected. In addition, the public recognizes the needs for additional funds for the Park Service. Notwithstand, uh, notwithstanding its problems of accounting and financial management, there are a lot of things that are not happening in the parks because they lack the people or the funding to do it. Uh, sources of new funds would include uh, concessions reform, which this body considered last year and passed by a 13 to 1 majority. Uh, but which did not reach enactment, uh, as well as a reasonable increase in entry fees. <laughs> I would next like to turn and make a few remarks about uh, financial management needs in the Park Service. That the Park Service can use additional funding is not doubted. Uh, let me talk a little bit about a survey that we commissioned last year of the Park Superintendents to see what they, the line managers, <laughs> thought about both park needs and management trends. Copies of this survey, incidentally, are available here this morning for members of the committee. It's this blue document. And uh, uh, if you would like it, we can get you a copy. I'd like to highlight two questions that appeared in this survey. First, we ask, what is the single biggest problem in preserving the natural and cultural resources in your park? Of the 235 parks which responded to that question, 92 superintendents named lack of budget resources as the biggest problem. An additional 58 named budget-related problems such as inadequate staff resources. We also asked, what is the single biggest problem in providing, the public, uh, in providing to the public use and enjoyment of the park? Answers to this question followed a similar pattern. Of 207 responses, 54 superintendents cited lack of budget resources as the single biggest problem. An additional 46 responses listed staff shortages and other budget-related issues. Superintendents are the line managers of the national park system. These men and women are the true stewards who live with the problems in the parks every day. Whatever these committee's response to the Park Service's management of its budget will be, special attention must be paid to the impact on the line managers. Clearly, if nearly 50 percent of these managers believe that the single biggest problem is related to lack of funds, any additional cuts at the park level are, will undoubtedly compromise the superintendent's ability to manage the parks in the best possible way. Finally, I would like to um, uh, say a few things about reorganization. NPCA supports the rapid implementation of the reorganization plan, which the service has put together over the last year or so in painstaking fashion. We believe the Park Service has done a good job of dealing with necessary cuts and restructuring, which they have been mandated to do, in order to put more staff in the parks and to move authority for decision making to the superintendent level. We do have one concern, which I mentioned in our testimony, and that is. Uh, how adequately the system support offices are going to function. Our concern there is there may not be enough people to serve it, to put into these offices to service the clusters they are designed to uh, assist. But we understand that NPS intends to give this concept a trial run by starting out locating these offices in existing regional office complexes now. 
And we would simply urge that uh, this be done uh, with flexibility in mind uh, and rolled out in a way that if, if, if it doesn't work out, some changes can be made. Finally, um, I agree with the GAO that it would be useful for the Park Service to begin thinking about innovation, cutting costs, and partnering with other federal and state agencies in the management of lands. In fact, the Park Service is already doing this in a number of locations. Yesterday, um, I was able to talk to the Secretary of Resources for the State of California, and he informed me that the State of California Park System and the National Park Service were cooperating at three different sites, Redwoods, Golden Gate, and Santa Monica. Uh, and that they had, uh, they had achieved uh, over a million dollars in budget savings by uh, jointly managing the ecosystems around in those three areas. So the Park Service is aware that this needs to be done. Clearly, a lot more of this needs to occur, and we would urge them to proceed in that direction. This concludes my testimony, and I'll be happy to answer any questions after all the testimony is presented. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chandler. And Director Kennedy, we're pleased to welcome you. Your full statement will be made a part of the record. This, with unanimous consent, you may proceed. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm not going to make a formal statement because it seems to me we've got a lot of material on the table this morning. I'd like to review very quickly how I think altogether we got here. Refer very briefly to the two well, there are really three reports before you. And try to put my emphasis where I think uh, you want to have it put. Uh, Mr. Hansen, in particular, Did you, want some you referred to the essential no, no, focus upon accountability, upon serving the public, upon knowing what we're doing. And a part of that, clearly, but not all of it, is adequate accounting data. Let, let's, let's take a, each of these, if we can, in sequence. I don't want to spend a lot of your time with a formal statement, but I would like to get some things on the table and then would like to be able to respond to questions. I am flanked by two Assistant Secretaries, George Frampton, who's my immediate boss, the Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. He'll have a short statement about the restructuring. And Bonnie Cohen came along this morning because she's the Chief Financial Officer and Assistant Secretary for the department, because as we get at the accounting problems and some of the accountability problems, we're going to have to get together on that with the way the department itself, in the aggregate, manages its financial affairs. So there may be some questions or perhaps a brief statement from her as we go along. But let's, if we can, sort of look at how we got here. The Organic Act of 1916 gave us a couple of responsibilities. They are to preserve these places that Americans have selected because they were important, both the uh, great green places like Yellowstone and Glacier, and the more specific historically related places like Independence Hall or Ellis Island, or most recently the school where Brown versus Board of Education came into American history. We have a, together with the preservation and protection responsibility, which carries with it maintenance, which is why maintenance is important, we have the equal responsibility to provide that people can get there, enjoy them, including enjoy them intellectually, learn something there. And taking care, therefore, of visitation is as important to us as taking care of the places themselves. But I'd have to say to you all that fundamentally, our responsibility goes to the protection of these places to being sure that they're there for our descendants. Because whatever we do with them today, there are going to be people coming along in a few hundred years that are neat, going to want to find them there. That's why the matter of accountability with respect to maintenance and the size of the backlog is not just an accounting matter, it's a matter of essential moral responsibility. During the course of the years, and I won't review one more time the pace of growth of the park system, you all know that that's been very rapid. You know that the uh, visitation has doubled in recent years. You know that the size of the park system in sheer acreage has doubled in the last decade and a half, I believe. 
I do want to touch on a couple of other things that aren't covered by the sheer expansion of the system. They are that we, like any other enterprise in this country, have acquired responsibilities for management that are expensive. They are things like what everybody else has to cope with, air quality, water resource protection, the appropriate and for us relatively new business of managing mining and minerals, including oil, within the national park system. These are management responsibilities that are new. OSHA, health and safety codes, the Disability Act. These are all imperatives that are unrelated to the size of the system, but they cost you money. You got to manage them. And in addition to that, an, another factor that is true of any large business, and that is that we have increasing entitlements. The staff to do this work is more expensive because, and it should be more expensive, because there is now a retirement system, which didn't apply to a whole lot of people, and all the process of insuring and other activity. Now, also, not in the easy data about how many more acres and how many more parks, is the simple matter of the expansion of the use of these parks by different kinds of people. Yellowstone's open in the winter. So are a lot of other parks. That means two things. First of all, it means you've got to have more people because you're taking care of more people at larger periods of the year. It's not just shoulder seasons. It's whole new seasons. But there's a subtler factor here, and it's important because the cost of the system needs to include a recognition of this. And that is that whereas you used to, most, many of these places used to be just open in the summer, they're now going all year. That means that you are converting from temporary employees, five or 6,000, we're not talking about a few, to permanent employees, which means that they cost you and should 40% more because they then get what they should get, which is appropriate insurance and retirement protection, which they don't get if they're temporaries. So I'm trying to suggest that over time, the national park system has acquired obligations to its people which are of equal importance over the long haul to its obligations to the places. And while we're not, I assume, going to be talking much about it at this point, we will be later, and that is that we need to house them better, pay them better and more fairly, and provide them the kinds of insurance and retirement protection that some of them still don't have. Now, as everybody in this room knows, in the last couple of years, we have, as a result of the budget agreement, been uh, under an obligation to bring the number of people in the Park Service down <coughs> by about 1,400 people. Now, the question arose, where are you going to get them? If you're going to bring the number of people down, where are you going to sweat them out? And the answer to that, embodied in our restructuring plan, is that we are taking them out of central offices regional offices and Washington, where we are going to be reducing and already are part way through reducing between 30 and 60 percent of central office functions. Now, I do not want to be somebody else who sits in front of you and tells you that's just wonderful. It's not so wonderful for the people, and it's also true, and we need to recognize this as a group, that when you take people out that have been performing functions over an extended period of time, those functions will not be done as well, however good you are at restructuring. Now, at the same time, people do things, useful things. When you take a lot of people out of there, things will happen more slowly. And you hope that you can work as we are now working at the listing of things that we and you can do together to diminish the amount of paperwork, report writing, triplicate and quadruplicate reports that have got to be rendered in many cases because the Congress requires it. Now, we've got to face up together to the economic cost of a park system and the difficult tension between accountability, which means letting somebody know what you're doing, 
and not having too much reporting, endless, unused reporting. That's hard to do. It's a management skill. We are working very hard at it. We won't get it perfectly, but we are working very hard at that. That is to say, how do you downsize, use fewer people in central offices, and at the same time provide for a decent reporting system? Now, we have in our reorganization plan, however, clung to the idea that it is at the point of service, the parks, that we've got to hold the line. And we have said, by golly, whatever else we have to do to get our numbers down and get our budgets down, we're going to hold the parks harmless, which really means we're going to try to do properly by our descendants. We have to protect these places. We also have to protect them from each other. We've got to protect them from the visitors, among other things. So our plan says cut it out of the central offices, recognize that there's a price in that, and keep the parks whole. Now, it is essential that when you do that, that you do it as these two, I think, excellent reports imply. That you do that knowing what you're doing. Now, if I may, I'd like to turn just very, very briefly. You've heard a lot of the details. Some of it, I must say to you, fresh and new to me because it wasn't in the written report to which I could have any opportunity to, to examine the details. I'm not going to bicker on details about one or another item in these reports. In general, they are excellent. And in particular, the Inspector General's report seems to me to be exactly the kind of accounting report that you should have and that we should have so that it forms the base upon which you and we can move and which you can ask about the remedies toward at regular intervals. Now, I am gratified that on, I think it's page, I don't know, 33, I think, of the IG's report that, that they say that they're encouraged by our commitment to devote the necessary resources to make these changes in the accounting system. And I'm further gratified that in the verbal testimony this morning, it was noted by the IG that we have agreed with them to get these things done and fixed on a schedule. It's not that we're going to sit here and tell you it's just wonderful the way it is or has been since the middle 80s when these problems arose. It's not wonderful. They need fixing. And we have an agreement with the Inspector General's office, which I'm sure they will confirm, under which we have worked out a protocol under which we together will get this fixed. I see very little utility in going back through the litany of problems that afflicted the park system's accounting in 1988-89 or made it impossible for there to be firm baseline data for 91, 92, 93. I see a lot of good in being very sure that you know that starting, not just now, but starting with the arrival of a, an agreement between us and the IG's office, that we're going to get these things fixed and that you can supervise us in doing that. In fact, I'd be delighted. I don't know how, uh, how uh, unconventional it would be, but it would seems to me that you've got adequate staff people. I'd be delighted if they would like to join with us in the IG's office as we go to be very sure that the improvements occur. Why not? Same thing, uh, I think, goes pretty much for the report of the uh, GAO. The GAO says the as I understand them, that the uh, restructuring plan is a pretty good idea, but it doesn't go far enough. Well, I don't have any uh, strenuous objection to that view. I agree with it. We're going to try to get on with a restructuring plan that gets us to, s to produce the services to the parks where they ought to be delivered, and we're going to get on with the process of cutting the people we've got to cut in the central offices. And at the same time, we will absolutely, as we now are, continue to look as we should for relocations with other federal agencies. And we will indeed and should get together on finding ways to do our business together. And not just federal agencies. I think it's nice that they think that the Department of the Interior's agencies and the Forest Service should 
get together on things and see if they can't save some money. But as uh, has earlier reference has been made to uh, our cooperation with the state of California, why not? We have a joint management scheme in the Redwoods now, brand new, very good idea. We'll save some money. Yesterday, I met with the chief of the parks of the state of California, and we worked together on a plan that will get us get together on the joint park operations we have around the Los Angeles area. Why not? We can share space, we can share people, we can get the work done better and for less money. Of course we should. Furthermore, we ought to be doing that in other places. And as we slowly work our way into this process of reordering the way the Park Service does its work in groups of parks of common character, sharing the scarce personnel, as we work our way toward that, of course, the windows ought to be open. And we ought to be talking to other people. Why not? It makes all kinds of sense. Now, I am informed that I remember that we've got a joint center with a lot of people, state and other feds, in Anchorage because it works there. I didn't know about Fairbanks, but we do, and I gather we, we do have a joint info center in Seattle. Now, we can work more in that direction and should. There are the four South Florida parks and the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I think as well the Corps of Engineers are at work together on a common management of places where we are over, overlaid upon each other, Chocolate Ripple. Now, in the North Cascades, we have a joint operation going on with the Forest Service. Now, my view of this is, and I suspect it would be true of any experienced professional manager who's been at trying to get large organizations to work less expensively and more efficiently, my view is, we ought to take each of these in sequence, get them done by a good set of stipulated dates. We ought to get the accounting system fixed, and we ought to do it soon enough so that some of us will be around when it's done, even though some of us weren't around when the problems arose, we should be around when it's fixed. We should deal with the reorganization plan as quickly as possible and get on with it. There are things we're going to be asking you for, both committees. They will be things that will let us do our work more efficiently. There are a whole raft of things that we need. They're not big in size, but they are flexibilities to let us get on with the housing problem. Now, I'm almost done, and I know I'm running on a little bit. I just want to let you know we're trying to get after this. With the GAO report, I concur vehemently, vehemently, that the numbers that have been offered for backlog problems have wobbled around in a way that makes one very uncomfortable. Is it four billion? Is it six billion? It's big. And the question that Mr. Hansen asked er earlier, which is, why is it still big? is because of one of the, among other reasons, that is the addition of functions and activities and parks and acreage, a subject for further discourse, the addition of further parks and acreage. Aside from that, it is absolutely true, as the General Accounting Office has said, that there has been a pattern, much of it congressionally ordained, in which not only are we given new parks to manage? But we're told to build things we didn't ask for, and there's been no maintenance budget to amortize that construction as there is in any sensible business concern. That's perfectly correct. That's right. That's one of our problems. And therefore, when you get a lot of new construction for a lot of places and you're not at the same time provided with the implication of further personnel, and further money to run them, you're going to acquire deferred maintenance. Now, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm grateful to you for letting me, Mr. Ch Messrs. Chairman, I am very grateful to you for letting me run along a little bit, but I wanted to be very clear with you all that we take very seriously these reports that are before you. We're going to get on with the stuff that we can do in an orderly, manner so you can hold us accountable for doing it. 
part of the accountability problem is just accounting, but a lot more is how do you hold people to doing their tasks on a known, written, contractual basis. And we can talk about that in a little bit if you'd like, but we feel, I feel very strongly that unless a manager has a contract with their superior, meaning superintendents and regional officers, they're unlikely to know what's expected of them and you can't hold them to accountability, including the accountability for the funds under their management. Now, if I may, I'd like to turn to Mr. Frampton, who's been, like you, patiently awaiting the end of my remarks. And Ms. Cohen, if she has anything she'd like to add. Uh, if I could, uh, could I add some remarks to uh, the Park Service directors? Um, yeah, without objection, but would you identify yourself for yes, the record, if you will? Yes, I'm Bonnie Cohen, Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget at the Department. And I think uh, Director Kennedy has given you a very persuasive overview of the problems facing the Park Service and his commitment to uh, correcting them. The Secretary asked me to come up here this morning to assure you of his commitment. He feels strongly that the financial management and program management needs of the Park Service has to be addressed. We feel, like Director Kennedy, that the IG's report and the GAO report will help we feel that they have effectively laid out the issues and the problems, and we will be addressing them. At this time, though, of great cynicism in the American public, we'd like to emphasize, as Chairman Regula did, that neither of these reports talks about corruption. They don't talk about $800 ashtrays. It's our sense that these problems have grown up over the last decade as dedicated professionals have tried to deal with limited resources and have turned their attention more to serving the American public and protection of the underlying resources than perhaps we would have liked to the management systems. We're now addressing those. We recognize that we're asking Congress for increased financial resources. We're asking for fee legislation, concessions legislation, increased leasing power. We know that that brings added responsibility to the Park Service. We have begun to address these issues. I just want to touch on a few things that we're doing to assure you that we're strengthening the accounting and management system. We have met both individually as, a, as the department and with the Park Service, with the IG. We've created a new task force to look at the financial accounting system and have lent people from the department to that task force. We have a new deputy chief financial officer coming, Sky Lesher, who many of you may know, who's been at OMB developing the financial systems for the federal government. The Park Service will be one of his first priorities. We have in our 96 budget asked for an increase in, manage in management training for the Park Service, largely to address these kinds of issues. We are undergoing downsizing in the department and in the Park Service, but we are asking that the resources required to address the accounting problems be spared from this downsizing until we have the systems in place to take care of the issues. We have just, or will be submitting in the next week, a report to Congress that you requested on Park Service construction in order to ensure that requests that come up or come up in a more rigorous format and that we follow up on construction to see that we meet the budgets that we originally anticipated. Uh, we anticipate that we will then move on to look at the maintenance programs. This just gives you a brief overview of the kinds of efforts that we're making to address these problems. Thank you. Mr. Frampton, did you want to, uh, Secretary Frampton, did you want to say some comment? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hansen, and Mr. Regula. Members of the committee, I do not have a prepared statement as uh, Director Kennedy and Assistant Secretary Cohen have told you, we know that the Park Service has had accounting problems in the past. We know what those problems are. Some of them are the result of a not yet complete uh, transfer of old data to a new system which works. We appreciate the analyses that have been made of those problems. We are going to fix those problems. We take those problems 
very seriously. We're going to get after him. The Secretary is committed to do that. The Director is committed to do that. And we are going to address those problems. I am here this morning, uh, Messrs. Chairman, uh, primarily to address the uh, restructuring, proposed restructuring plan, which uh, is described in detail in a reprogramming letter that has been submitted to the Chairman and the ranking minority members of the Appropriations Committees in both uh, this House and the Senate. And to emphasize that that proposed restructuring plan first is a high priority for the Secretary and the Department. It is a flagship effort to reinvent government. And also to emphasize to all the members of both committees that this is a plan that is going to have very significant benefits for the American taxpayer, for park visitors, for people in the park service, for neighbors and partners of the parks, particularly local and state governments, people that the park service has to work more closely with, and ultimately for the parks themselves and for future generations. Now, this restructuring proposal began uh, over, work on it began, I guess, over a year ago, primarily as an effort to meet the commitment of the administration and the commitment of the Congress, the instruction of the Congress to reduce uh, FTEs across the government. And it was begun as an effort to do that, meeting the instruction of the Secretary that the parks themselves be held harmless, so that we would do whatever reductions the Park Service had to make in its total number of FTEs in central offices and in the 10 regional offices across the country, which have grown significantly over the last decade. So it began as an effort simply to meet the streamlining requirements of the administration and the Congress in this agency. But that planning effort quickly broadened out to be something much more important than that. And that is an effort to try to look at what the Park Service needs to be in the 21st century to meet some very different changing challenges and demands. What are those changing challenges and demands. First, Park Service, in facing an increasingly complex set of problems to protect our parks, needs to put a lot more expertise to work without having a lot more money to do it. We can't afford to hire archaeologists and biologists and law enforcement specialists and people who do training in every single national park. So we have to create and sustain a pool of people with a wide range of diverse professional skills in a more cost-effective way. That's one of the changing needs of the Park Service. Another is that the Park Service needs to be more outward-looking. The Park's personnel and Park Service people in central offices and in the parks need to work with neighbors and partners. That means local government, county government, state government. It means private landowners. It means nonprofit organizations. Park Service needs a structure which encourages and enables people who work in the service to do that more effectively. Third, the Park Service needs to be more adept and creative at designing solutions for an increasing set of problems and to be able to apply those solutions and ideas across the service. So parks need to work together much more than they have in the past. And what we have submitted in the form of a proposed restructuring plan is designed not just to trim the bureaucracy and reduce layers of approval and to cut the number of FTEs in central and regional offices while increasing the number of people who are in the parks. It's designed to make this organization a more effective and efficient organization in the future. This is what we think the voters voted for in November. 
This is where the Park Service needs to go. This is where people are telling us the federal government needs to go. Be a more effective and efficient organization at less cost. And we are very eager to get on with this restructuring plan. And let me just, let me just close by uh, uh, commenting on uh, Mr. Duffus's uh, recommendation in the GAO report that you've heard about this morning that uh, and we appreciate the endorsement of the restructuring plan uh, both by uh, the National Parks and Conservation Association and by GAO. But I want to comment on Mr. Duffus's uh, recommendation that while this is a good thing, we need to go further. He's absolutely right. We are going further. What the restructuring plan does is create the ability within the Park Service, the platform, the structure that enables the Park Service to work with other federal agencies and with the states and with local government more effectively. We would not have an approved forest plan for the Pacific Northwest if we had not structured a program for federal agencies for the first time ever in the Northwest, including the National Park Service, to work together. Yesterday I was in Seattle uh, announcing a proposed rule that would relieve restrictions on most of the private forest land in the states of Washington and California, a Fish and Wildlife Service program, and the National Park Service in Seattle uh, through its work together in the regional interagency task force provided the support for this program. Last Thursday and Friday I was in the California desert with officials from the Defense Department and the three military services, uh, as well as the BLM and the Park Service, working out an arrangement in which the Interior Department and the Defense Department will do coordinated planning in Southern California to make sure not only that our parks, including the new Mojave National Preserve and the BLM areas are managed efficiently, but that we manage those lands in a way that the very important Defense Department missions that are carried out at Nellis Air Force Base and Fort Irwin and China Lake, which are key to the training and readiness of the military services, are preserved over a long period of time. In South Florida, we have a task force which involves not only six federal departments, 11 agencies, but state and federal government. These are the things that the Park Service is doing around the country. The restructuring plan that we have before you enables us to do that more effectively and in a more widespread fashion in the future. That's why we're so eager to move forward and get on with this, because it enables us to do the kinds of things the GAO says we should be doing. It doesn't, won't solve all the problems of the National Park Service, but it'll make it a lot easier to solve many of them and do it at less cost and more effectively. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate the, the uh, testimony from the witnesses. Uh, this is going to get kind of long if we don't start tying this thing down a little bit. I think what we will do now is we'll hear an opening statement from the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, Mr. Yates, and then Mr. Richards from, from the Authorizing Committee, and then we'll go to questions. We've determined, and without uh, uh, I would appreciate it, uh, maybe ask for unanimous consent, that we allow each person to ask two questions. However, I've got to ask the witnesses to be brief in your answers. If they don't stay within five minutes, those lights you see in front of you, we're going to turn those on, and as soon as the red light goes, we're going to cut you off. That if we let everybody answer the question in, in great detail, or if we ask a question in great detail. So we'll turn to uh, Mr. Yates and then Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, over the years I've been in Congress, I've always considered the Park Service to be one of the great organizations of this country. Uh, it, its staff has been outstanding. Uh, we're delighted the, uh, the Rangers are as good an organization as they are. Uh, they've been headed by very able men, particularly at this time, our good friend Roger Kennedy is a an able ad and a confident administrator. Uh, I'd like to raise one point. At a hearing before our Appropriations Subcommittee uh, a few days ago, it was either the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, which suggested that the Park Service, uh, in order to save money, ought to be closed and the, um, 
uh, the, the lands either sold or turned, uh, ba they said, back to the states. I didn't know that the lands were part of the states in the, in the first instance. But uh, I'd like to get the, the uh, impressions from any of you who want to answer that question. How much money do you think would be saved, other than the amount of your budget? And how much money would you realize if you sold those lands? Could you pay off the national debt? Nobody want to answer the question? <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Richardson. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, first, uh, Mike's are alive. Let me, let me join in uh, associating myself with the remarks about uh, the Park Service being a, a great agency. It is. And uh, I know Director Kennedy, and I want to support him in this effort. Uh, but I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I've got some concerns. Uh, and the concerns are based from uh, not just uh, parks uh, people that come to my town meetings and express uh, reservations of this plan, but also because of my experience for many years as a member of the uh, chairing the Native American subcommittee and uh, for years we've heard about the BIA reorganizing itself and it continues to do that and it makes things worse. And Director Kennedy, I don't want that happening to your agency. I know you're very dedicated. I think our objective here is getting the best bang for the nation's park buck. But I have to tell you some of the policy issues, I know there's a lot of financial management issues that, that are being discussed. but. Uh, some of the policy issues that, that I'd like to raise are, first of all, how does, for instance, uh, these are, I'm not, I'm, I'm, these is, this is my opening statement, so you don't have to answer this, but uh, how, for instance, does creating seven field offices and 16 system support offices mean a downsizing from 10 regional offices? Another policy concern is how can we maintain consistency in laws and policies when we do this decentralizing? Uh, how can we be sure that uh, the big parks don't squeeze uh, the little parks? Uh, how are we going to be uh, sure that uh, we have the funds to implement this reorganization plan? Uh, how are we going to uh, expect all the employees, uh, all the required employees to accept uh, reassignment from central office uh, to the field? How, for instance, are you going to get competition uh, there's been healthy competition between the parks over the years. Will this plan mean that uh, they're going to have to start cooperating with each other? Can that happen? Now, hopefully it can. But uh, I have to tell you that uh, I worry about these uh, schemes of uh, deep financial reorganization, uh, downsizing. Uh, and, and what I worry about is that... Uh, we have to do a better job of maintaining our parks. We have to do a better job of having more people out on the ground. Uh, we need to, uh, I'm worried about having, hire, having you request us uh, hiring so many financial managers that the actual management of the park, the rangers, that uh, we not uh, deal with that. Uh, I worry about this backlog issue. I've been trying to get a handle on exactly what the amount is, five billion, six billion. Four billion. I think we have to narrow that down. And I must say that I've uh, heard people use this idea that a backlog exists as the reason to halt any uh, further consideration of additions to the national park system. I think that's wrong. I think that we have to be careful about uh, charging ourselves with maintaining what we have, but we can't allow irreplaceable national treasures not to be protected by uh, dealing with a backlog, which is serious. But, uh, you know, some of those backlogs are wish lists, and, and we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me say, Director Kennedy, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt uh, as you reorganize, but uh, there are a lot of policy issues here, and I want to be sure that you don't end up like the BIA. You know, what they did is, after they couldn't complete all the reorganization, they asked for another year so that they could study further how they can screw things up worse. So with that uh, admonition in your own department, <coughs> please don't uh, let that happen to you. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, I just, uh, Mr. Gage. I just wanted to say for the record that I don't agree with the recommendations of the Heritage Foundation or the Cato okay. Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Mr. Yates, if it's necessary to be on the record yeah. about that, either do I. <laughs>
We appreciate those remarks by uh, Mr. Yates and Mr. Richardson. Just to make sure everybody understands now what we're going to do, I'll take the first two questions, Mr. Regular takes the next two, then we're going to alternate back and forth between the Appropriation Committee and the Authorizing Committee, and everyone's limited to two questions, and the witnesses have all vowed they'll give short answers. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, we all agree on that, and we'll take one or two rounds as we go, and we appreciate uh, the comments by the people we've had here. I have some folks from my district on a questions in the back office here, so I think I'll just say a little comment, and then we'll go to Mr. Regular, if we may. I, in my opening comments, I pointed out in 1991 that the National Park Service reported to Congress an operational backlog of $377 million. Four years later, after Congress had increased the National Park Service operating budget by $308 million, the reported backlog has more than doubled to $846 million. Uh, this is shades of the District of Columbia, to a certain extent, wondering, uh, will the real figure stand up? And it's a great concern to me to see this happen. Now, you've all alluded to the idea that there's this program that you've mentioned that Secretary Frampton talked about, and you talked about, Mr. Kennedy, that's going to solve these things. As I listen to the comments made by James Duffus and uh, by Joyce Fleischman, I really wonder if it will. I would hope that you would give this committee a step-by-step, uh, point-by-point, -point, brief, to-the-point, objective, concise report on how you really, honestly, seriously intend to do it. I don't think it does any good to go back and talk about what was done earlier and who fouled up in a prior administration. We're living today. You've had the reins for two years. We some want to see some results. I think this Government Performance and Results Act of 1993 that Mr. Duff has talked about is something we'd kind of like to hold you to. Uh, the ball's in your court. I agree with what was stated by uh, Mr. Yates, Mr. Richardson. We're all believers in the park. Regardless of what the press says, we want to see the parks look good and be uh, uh, the, the jewels. People constantly write in and talk to us how strong they feel about these parks. So I, uh, and I agree with that. And most of them are in the state of Utah, incidentally, or a lot of them. And we feel very strong about that. So uh, we want to do everything in our power to make sure that they're what the public demands. When they go there, they want restrooms and plumbing that works. They want roads they can travel along. They want concessionaries that are clean and nice. And uh, it's a great responsibility for you, Mr. Kennedy, to live up to that. So with that in mind, I'll turn to Mr. Regular with just one thing that Mr. Chandler said, which kind of threw me a little bit. For my 15 years on this committee, we've always talked about overall condition of visitor facilities adequate cultural resource and quality of visitor center. However, Mr. Chandler, on page 14, he says the two problems that he sees on his survey, and I have no reason to doubt this, are overall park budget and adequacy of workforce size. Uh, I will turn to uh, Mr. Regula and be back, and then we'll follow the procedure that you've seen. I would hope that we hear from you on the th concerns that we have. Mr. Regula. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I think uh, going directly to what you've just said, uh, Mr. Kennedy, you've heard the comments uh, from the IG and the GAO, and my question is, will the restructuring, the reorganization plan address the concerns, uh, criticisms that were embodied in their remarks and in the plan or in the uh, surveys that they have done, and if so, and I know you don't have time to get into a lot of specifics, but uh, we're concerned about uh, the impact of the restructuring plan on those problems. Um, should I be responding at this point, sir? Yes. Uh, I'll try to do that. Uh, we share and accept uh, Mr. Hansen's uh, charge that we should operate under the Government Performance and Results Act of August 3, 1993. That's appropriate. It's our charge. We are the lead agency in the Department of the Interior in doing that. And we do intend to give you the reports that Mr. Hansen has alluded to. We'll begin with giving you the protocol between us and the Inspector General's office, which tells you exactly when we're going to get on with that part of it. That's the accounting part. Now, <coughs> the accounting part is, is different from the reorganization. So it's a different kind of subject, except that we've had, as Secretary Cohen has said, we we pulled out of the downsizing in the central offices enough people to do the accounting work. You don't want to downsize the accountants when you're trying to get your accounting work done better. So that part of it has been accepted, taken out of. With regard to the GAO, the GAO's reports require us to get on with the Government Performance and Results Act, in particular with respect to accountability, and I'd like to give you a little more extended 
written report about that because you don't want me to give you a long, long answer. But we can do that. We can do that. That's a reasonable piece of legislation, and what it, it requires us to get on with some accounting changes and some accountability changes. I think, Mr. Chairman, that the primary response to your question, which as I understand it is the relationship of the restructuring plan to these two reports. That's correct. Is first that the IG's report is about accounting. And the, the uh, General Accounting Office report is both about that because it catches up the IG's report, and I think we've dealt with that. We're, we're going to get that fixed. We must be charged to getting that fixed, and we'll do it. The restructuring plan has to do with doing the business with fewer people and emphasizing delivery of services in the parks. And that is wholly compatible, as the General Accounting Office report itself says. That restructuring plan, as they have said, is wholly compatible with their report. Thank you. One uh, quick question. Uh, you point out that you have increased visitation. It's uh, grown tremendously. Will you be able to meet the needs of the, uh, in terms of safety and enjoyment of visits while you're doing all the restructuring and putting your efforts into the accounting and some of the other things? It seems like it's a big challenge to do both. The services to which you refer are delivered at the park level. Safety, maintenance of safety of trails, uh, law enforcement, and the maintenance of the places. It's precisely because of the emphasis upon the delivery of those services, including safety, at the park level, that all this restructuring business says keep the parks whole. And in fact, if you can, push a few more people toward the parks, which is what we're going to do if you give us the money. Thank you. Now, um, in the absence of the uh, chairman of the authorizing committee, as he mentioned, we're going according to the order in which members arrived. And there will be two questions. We'll start with Ms. Chanoweth from Idaho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't quite know where to begin because I've got to say that with all due respect, this report that we have received from Mrs. Fleischman and Mr. Duffin is one of the most egregious reports I have ever seen. With all due respect for your office and the responsibilities that you hold, I would have to say, Mr. Kennedy, that if I had heard this report and I were you, I would not be one to say I am delighted with the report. I would not be one that would say, whereas we cannot bicker over the details, we must move on with asking the Congress for more money. I would get about the business of making a report to the Congress and to the GAO that clearly lays out where your $6.6 billion assets are line by line as compared to your $68 million reported liabilities. The GAO or the Congress cannot get that. With all due respect, I'm not scolding you. I am just simply saying I, I'm amazed that you would be here asking us for more money. $6.6 billion is a whole lot of money in assets. And in 1995, you were given $88 million to acquire more land. And yet, we can't get an answer on what land you're going to acquire. I find that in the report that was given to us on the top of page four. I see Mr. Chandler is re referring to that. Um, but I would like, uh, I, as, as a member of the Congress, I would like to, to uh, make a request officially, Mr. Chairman, as to, number one, what land you already own and where you intend to invest the $88 million in more land acquisition. I visited the Crater Lake National Park last year. 
I had worked there as a young woman. Beautiful park, beautiful facilities. It was in a, in a state of total disrepair. Yellowstone National Park facilities are in a state of total disrepair. And yet, we're acquiring more land. Somehow, we talk about using the terms that business uses, but I know from being a businesswoman, I know how business acts. And that is that when we have less money, we still have to do more. We have to make it work. My question, oh, I'm also concerned about the fact that you did make the statement that when people are taken out, things will be done more slowly. And that when we downsize, we will, we will not be able to provide for decent reporting services. Um, again, with all due respect, sir, <coughs> as in business, as this nation has faced across this land from one end to the other, we've had to do more with far less. I do remember the sad commentary of the Cuyahoga National Park, where lands were seized, homes were, were seized against the will of people. There is a growing concern across the nation of how the Park Service is conducting its business. So my question to you, Mr. Kennedy, is may we receive an accurate report of your assets May we receive an accurate report of the land you intend to acquire, and um, may we receive an accurate report of the land that you already do have in your possession, and may we receive that within 30 days. May I respond, Mr. Chairman? Yes, you're, I assume you're going to provide this for the record, but sure. you want a brief comment because of the time. Brief comment. Today. Independence Hall. Ellis Island, the Washington Monument, are very difficult to appraise. You've asked for an appraisal of our assets as if it were all land. We shall endeavor to give you what you asked for, which is a report and an accurate one, on the land that we own. But I think we'd agree that it's very hard to set a dollar value on places of that character. Um, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kennedy, but you have given us a ballpark, ballpark of $6.6 .6 billion. Within that ballpark, I'm sure the Washington Monument in Ellis Island is contained. I want to see a line-by-line, -line, park by park sure. determination of where those assets are and how they're evaluated. Um, I, I would, you know, the report that we got is, is nothing short of almost criminal in its reporting. I mean, when, when we see a vacuum cleaner that was worth $150 being listed for over $800,000 and a dishwasher worth $350 that was listed for over $700,000 and a fire truck worth $133,000 that was listed for one penny. Do you see, sir, where our concern is? And I know, sir, you did not put this report together personally, but um, I know that you know the buck stops with you. It does indeed, Ms. Janowith, and, and um, I do know where your concern comes from. And it's more than a concern because in private business, if a report like this was given to a private business, the person making these kinds of accounting procedures and being responsible for them would either be fired or be behind bars. Well, uh, Mr. Um, Stay. I'm Excuse sorry, me. Mr. Chairman, but with, with all due respect, <laughs> I did have to express my feeling that well, I am absolutely shocked. Well, I think this information will be provided for the record by the director. And Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Skaggs. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question. I, I do want to invite uh, Ms. Fleischman's comment as to uh, the reassurances we've received from Director Kennedy and the others from the Department of Interior 
uh, that we're flying in formation now as opposed to uh, at each other in dealing with the recommendations that the Inspector General has made about needed improvements in accounting procedures. I am happy to, to tell you that last June, when we made the initial uh, briefings to both Ms. Cohen and to Ms. Mr. Kennedy, they were most responsive. Since that time, they have in the National Park Service, with the help of the Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Cohen, by the way, is also the Chief Financial Officer of the Department of the Interior. They have put together a management plan, a management improvement plan that hopefully should, if carried out, will result in improvements to their, account, their accounting system so that they will be able, in the National Park Service, to put together an accurate, auditable financial statement. And even more importantly, will provide accurate accounting data for the National Park Service to use in carrying out its duties day by day. So yes, what Mr. Kennedy told you is absolutely accurate. They are in the process of implementing that, their plan, and we are confident that if they do it, if they continue along this, this track, things will be better. And Mr. Kennedy, uh, I'm uh, in some sense reminded of the old Pogar cartoon, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, to what extent, and, and I know you might be a little bit reticent about responding, but to what extent is the stretching of your resources, the, the dealing with the backlog of maintenance, uh, the need to uh, uh, move central office personnel out into the field, driven by congressionally mandated expansion of the park system? A great deal. A great deal. Uh, the lady from Idaho uh, talked about your intention to acquire acreage. I assume you don't have any independent discretion or authority to go out and buy lands. We, we tell you what to do. Is that not correct? No, sir, that's correct. Thank you, Chairman. Now, Mr. Kildee. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, one question. Uh, Congress uh, cannot manage nor does want to manage the Park Service. But maybe to Mr. Kennedy and others from the department who might want to answer this, what are the actions which the Congress should take or not take to address uh, these problems of the Park Service? Could we give you a detailed and precise response to that question, sir? I would like that, but I think there must be something in your mind sure. that you would have mind what we should do or not do, yeah. uh, anyone at the table, but I, I would wait for a detailed one, too. Yeah. If I, if I could respond to that very briefly. There, there are two very important things that the Congress can do, easily the most important things to help the Park Service meet its backlog, uh, meet its maintenance needs, and meet its visitor services needs. And that is to enact legislation which came very close to uh, passing both houses at the end of the last Congress and it will be or is before you now, legislation that would permit the Park Service to take some of the fees, entrance fees to the service and put that money back into infrastructure uh, repair and maintenance and legislation that would enable the Park Service to take a larger share of the uh, franchise fees from concession operations and also recycle those funds back into uh, uh, maintenance, infrastructure, and also uh, infrastructure for the visitors. Most people, I, I would bet you 99% of the people who go to our national parks think that when they pay five dollars or ten dollars for a car full of people to spend two weeks in a park that some of that money is going to support the park service and it's not and the same thing with concession uh, revenues which are generated by park operations those are the two very high priorities for us in the department the two single single thing congress could do would be to move forward on those proposals Anyone else at the table would like to respond? Mr. Chandler, you were... Well, uh, 
Congressman, I think you ask a very perceptive question. It's just not one thing or the other that has to be done here. I, th I think that uh, both of the committees have to look at the comprehensive picture here. Yes, we need better management in the parks, and that falls on the shoulder shoulders of the executive branch to make sure that happens, and on your shoulders as the oversight body to make sure that they get there. Likewise, we need... Um, uh, we need to clear out some of the underbrush, some laws that don't work anymore, like the Concessions Policy Act, which would also render additional fees to the Park Service. We have done focus groups with the American people who are very aware of that problem. They're also aware that the entrance fees probably are too low. And they're saying, you know, we're willing to pay more entrance fees, but we want that money to stay in the parks. And it's always sort of been a mystery to me, frankly, as to why these two committees cannot get together and convince the Congress that all of the user fees that come into the Park Service basically ought to be automatically appropriated back to the parks so that they can get on doing their job. And I know that there, uh, 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 I know that in the past that has, uh, has raised problems in terms of prerogatives and so forth, but I really believe that the American people want those fees to stay in the parks because they want the park system to be a first-rate park system. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Mr. Kildee, I would just like to add that I, I agree with what Mr. Frampton said about the franchise fees and, and the uh, entrance fees and so forth, but as I said in my statement, I would just like to stress that with that additional uh, uh, funding, uh, we need to have increased accountability for how those funds are spent and what's being accomplished. I should like to add that from our perspective, the single most important aspect of this is that the Park Service be able to account for its money from whatever source and what it does with it. And to the extent that Congress can require and insist that the Park Service do that, that would be, from our perspective, a great help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Vukanovich. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Kennedy, we've talked today about accountability within the Park Service, National Park Service, and I, I wanted to make you aware of a serious problem I've been having with the superintendent of the Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Um, obviously, I'm not going to mention, I mean, give you this today, but in the interest of time and also, um, I, I'm really concerned. I, I'd like to submit questions and a background of the problem. However, I want you to know that I am extremely displeased with the superintendent's actions toward one of my constituents, who is a concessionaire. And uh, I'm disturbed, and I think that you need to be aware of uh, the lack of accountability in solving this problem. We've worked on it for a long time with no accountability. So rather than... Um, put you on the spot today, I would like to submit the information to you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no other questions at the moment. Mr. Cooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> I uh, find Mrs. Chinowick so uh, very polite and, and, and proper that I, I, I don't know what to say, but as a businessman and as a uh, Mrs. Fleischman put up the auditing process, um, and we are the board of directors. I would say that uh, we need to uh, maybe talk to our auditing firm first to go well, why since 1992, we had 93 and 94, we have not been able to audit this particular branch of the government. I think Congress should have been notified this much earlier than let this go so long uh, to become such a problem that we have today. Uh, as uh, president and chairman of several corporations, I would have fired you as an auditing firm for allowing to go so long without making Congress apprised of the problems we were having with this park, I mean, this division. Um, in plain business sense, systems should all be the same. An accounting system certainly should match each other so it can be audited properly. Why we waited this long in order to talk about it, I can't figure that out either. Commenting on Mr. Randall's statement um, about closing, selling, or whatever to do with it, maybe we ought to shut down some of the park system, take some of the funds we have, upgrade the ones that, that are most used, and therefore provide the public with a better park system for those parks that are being used by the public generally. I notice in some of the briefing material we find here 
And we're talking about $70 million moving costs to open up these new 16 offices, and we don't have the money, and you're asking us for more appropriations. In 1995, uh, fiscal year received $1.4 billion. 80% of that are $1 billion appropriated for park operations, and we weren't able to do it. There's no accounting system that verifies what we did with that money. Uh, we had uh, $43 million for national recreation and preservation. Where did that go? No accounting of that. We had $185 million for construction. Where did that go? No accounting, I presume. And four, four, 41.5 million for horse, historical preservation and $88 million set aside for land acquisitions. I presume that the $88 million is still sitting in the count and has not been used, or is that gone as well? I think that um, as a, a, a member of Congress and uh, let's say the board of directors of this country, I think that uh, this actually teeters on the problem of maybe having some criminal activities involved and just plain neglect. There's no excuse for neglect. There's no excuse for not having accountability. And if we have had no accountability since 1992, there's absolutely no excuse for this. And I know that uh, we, there's a lot of humor involved in this process. I can see some people down there smiling. This is not funny. We need to put a handle on this, find out what's going on, and get down to the nitty-gritty details. This general overall glossary, just not acceptable, I don't think. I think the 104th Congress, with the amount of people we've had in this Congress involved in business and looking at some of these agencies, we need to turn around and really look at this agency in finite detail, spend some time, and then for heaven's sakes, don't appropriate any more money until we can find out what the money that we've already given you where it's went. This is public funds. We are trusted with those public funds, and we should be able to go back to the American people and tell them what happened to their money. And if we can't, we certainly shouldn't give you any more. Mr. Coley, I'd like to respond uh, if, briefly if I can. We have issued written reports to the Congress on each of our attempts to audit the National Park Service's financial statement, as well as multiples of tens of audit reports over the last 10 years, on, and in fact longer, on the state of affairs in the National Park Service. Every time we issue a report, I would say, estimate that approximately 100 copies are delivered that day to the United States Congress. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Uh, so the red light goes on, you've got the floor. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Fleischman. I wasn't here there. I apologize for criticism, but I, but, I, but I think as a member of this body, we should be ashamed of ourselves because we should have jumped on this in 1992 and looked at this thing and addressed it at that time until we were not in the situation we are today in 19, looking at 1996. So I didn't mean to direct insult to you. Uh, I didn't realize that these reports were put out. So pardon me for that and shame on us for us for doing what we've done. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, could I briefly respond on the land acquisition program of the Park Service because it's come up a couple of times? Uh, the land, just to clarify it, the land acquisition program of the Park Service, as well as the construction program, uh, they operate similarly. The Park Service is not authorized to acquire any land that isn't within authorized park boundaries. Within those boundaries, the Park Service then prioritizes the land that it wants to acquire land that's in holdings that people want to sell, land that's threatened with imminent development, uh, land that's critical, critical to the message of the park. Once that's prioritized, a list is developed according to those priorities. That list is then submitted to Congress, the same is true of the construction budget, uh, purchase by purchase, and Congress does approve those each year. Thank you. Mr. Skeen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been a very interesting uh, dialogue today, and I always enjoy listening to the direct park director, Mr. Kennedy. He's such a shy, retiring individual, but he handles himself very well, and I have a great deal of admiration for you. You've done a very tough job. 
I'm a little confused. Of course, being a member of Congress, that comes with the territory, I suppose. But I had always been given to understand, and we have a, a lot of park presentation in the state of New Mexico, that, that the, the individual installation retains part of the entrance fees under the operation and agreement that you have now. Is that not correct? No, sir. It goes back to the general revenues. Unless there's an exception that I don't know about. Uh, the there, there are some exceptions, I believe, because I've been given to understand that in some cases, uh, it's uh, entrance fees. Mr. The entrance fees or the, yeah. the daily fees are, are retained could, by the collection. installation. Yeah. Could, could I respond to that, Mr. Chairman? Surely. Uh, in the last two years, uh, Congress has permitted the Park Service to retain 15 percent of entrance fees uh, to, for the purpose of collecting uh, fees in the future. And the reason for that is that the current system, if you didn't have that, provides a tremendous disincentive to park superintendents to collect any fees at all. If you're a park superintendent, without that 15 percent, your rational management discretion is going to be exercised not to collect any fees, because the people you put on fee collection are people who aren't taking care of campgrounds and visitors and law enforcement, and none of the money's coming back to the Park Service. So we do have the ability to apply some money from entrance fees simply for the cost of collection, but that money does not go to any other park purposes, infrastructure, visitor services. It just removes the perverse incentive not to collect any fees, which is there without that. Well, I'm not knocking the practice. I think that you're probably exactly right. But uh, evidently there's some confusion, too, uh, insofar as the message coming back to us that we'd like to have those entrance fees totally dedicated to park service, but they've got to be accounted for somewhere, uh, yes, somewhere along the line. Yes, I have a problem with that because I've heard from one or two of, of our installations in New Mexico that they retain part of those fees in a discretionary fund. Uh, other than the 15 percent, I don't believe that's the case, sir. No, sir. We, we, we will take a look specifically. I'm not trying to indict anybody. No, <laughs> no sir. In the park, sir. No, sir. Uh, that's a heck of a deal. I, I believe they do not, but we will give you a specific report on that matter. The next. Uh, concern I have is the uh, discussion and the, the uh, negotiations that are going on between the concessionaires and the Park Service, which has been a very, very difficult and, and a very sore subject. Where are we now insofar as moving it or changing it or coming up with a general policy or, or we, something of that kind so that we can get down to business of operating? Because right now you've got warfare going on in the Park Service. Between yes, sir, we service. do. There's legislation we've asked for, which I believe there's a pretty broad consensus behind, and uh, with that, in place, which I hope we get to real quick, we'll get on with this. There, but you are developing a, a new. Oh yes, sir. We'll be we'll be at you very shortly with that. Is there going to be more. equity in settling all the proprietary rights and all the uh, those? Uh, I think so, sir. Those, those situations. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope so because it is not a, it does not add to the uh, general aura of uh, peaceful comedy <laughs> around parks with, when you got hand grenades going between the park service the personnel and the. In the concessionaire. One last question, uh, or one last statement. Uh, we had a little problem with, uh, with the lunch room in Carlsbad Cavern. It's been there for 60 some odd years. Uh, I, and I think that the decision was made to remove the con concession, or that part of the concession from the subterranean part of the cavern. But thanks to the largesse of my friend and, and Mr. Yates over there, we, uh, we had to stay on it until we could have a, a little discussion about it. And the idea was that the, there was something, it, it was deteriorating the, uh, the, the pristine nature of the ca caverns and so forth. But when I talked to park personnel, the real problem was lint, not the food service. Or anything like well, nobody said anything to me about lint during all this terrible argument that we'd had and discussion we'd gone on. We were trying to mediate the thing and try to get it all settled because most of the people around in the area and those who go there wanted the lunchroom left in the, in the cavern as it is in all the other caverns. But it came down to the point where what it was was a lint problem. And the lint problem was from taking T-shirts and, and souvenirs and things of that kind down in the caverns. And so uh, I think that they've probably resolved it. But I hope that they, when it comes to, to the point of resolving some of these problems, that they have a little more uh, 
uh, illuminating conversations with when, especially when a member of Congress gets involved in the thing and trying to find out who's on first and what's on second. Uh, we'd like to help rather than be become a, an obstacle. Yes, sir. And we've been trying to get in, and I, I do agree to you with the, the, the backlog of money on, on the repairs and things like that is terribly, terribly deficient. It has been for some time. And I hope that we can come up with a funding plan that will take care of these things because housing at White Sands Monument is horrible. It hasn't been touched in ages. Water system at the Carlsbad Caverns, we, we got some money for that. We hope to renovate it. But I want to tell you folks that you've done a great job over there, but it's time... I think we've taken you for granted for too long. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Studs? I want to commend uh, Mr. Hanson and Mr. Regula. I'm, all the years that I've been here, which is more than I care to concede, I have never seen a hearing combining an appropriation and an authorizing committee. I think it's a very good idea. American people don't know the difference anyway. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> And I want to commend you for, for holding calm under the blistering fire from your own side over there about where the hell have you been for the last umpteen years. <laughs> you too, Mr. Yates. <laughs> and, uh, and all of you at the table, especially Director Kennedy, I want to commend you for your restraint. Um, and I'm certainly, <laughs> I could have sworn I heard the Inspector General use the phrase 10 years at one point. I can only assume that the very disturbing reports that we have been presented with today reflect a situation that did not suddenly develop in the last year and a half or two years. Is that a safe statement? Yes, sir. And I seriously and sincerely commend you for not doing what must have been somewhat tempting to go back and try to point some fingers elsewhere. I don't think, I think you were correct in not doing that. I don't think any purpose would have been served. And I think we ought to be focusing on what we can all do together to help what a very serious situation. Uh, I don't come from one of the sprawling districts in the great open spaces of the West, but I, I do have what I think is one of your gems in the National Seashore on Cape Cod. God knows how you would ever assess that property, 30 miles of ocean beach in an area where, I don't know if the Westerners can stand this, one-eighth of an acre is usually assessed at about $300,000 or more. That's one-eighth of an acre, if you want to try that in Western style. <laughs> I, God, I, I can't imagine. And if you could, I, I wouldn't believe it. It's, it's almost akin and it's challenging to try to put a dollar figure on a human life. But you, some things you can't put dollar figures on, and you're in charge of many of those things. And I appreciate that difficulty. I'm also in a situation which now seems to be more awesome than it ever did, along with Mr. Torkelson, of trying to persuade these committees to add an incredibly modest little bit of acreage to the system. Just a little few islands in Boston Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's just dawning on me how challenging a task uh, that may be. What can we do to help you? I mean, aside from more money, obviously, which in a perfect world we would shower upon you. Uh, but are there specific reporting requirements we can relieve you of, or what are the, then the most obvious ways can we be helpful? The fee bill, the concessions bill, the three or four things that uh, will help us get on with the housing problem, where there are specific things we need from you, authorizations to enter an agreement with third parties and provide language that gives us a National Park Foundation presence because they can do some things we can't do, we need to be able to do land exchanges for housing purposes. We need to be able to postpone for our people, for goodness sake, the capital gains uh, on the sale of their homes as the military can. Same situation. It's absolutely unfair that that can't happen. We need to be able to acquire property outside the parks a little bit, put housing on it just for that purpose. And we need to continue to press to get housing out of parks and into communities near parks. There are dozen other specific congressional actions that would help us but actually you're doing a lot to help us here we may not i may not like getting beaten up here and there but this is exactly what we ought to be doing we're talking about our problems we're going to see how we're going to get on with fixing them that's what we should be doing and uh thank you i right, thank you and i'd like to see the rest of that list sometime yeah thank we'll you thank that, you mr chairman <clears throat> mr dix Mr. Chandler, you, I, I've had a chance to look at all three of these reports, and uh, having served on this committee for a long time, I'm very disturbed, as are the other members, about you know, the examples that we've seen in the, uh, in the very fine work done by the Inspector General. I was one of those who strongly supported creation of the Inspector Generals just for this very purpose. But uh, I must say, with the tremendous backlog 
in uh, the maintenance area to take care of the existing parks. Um, I am, as someone who has always believed in the park system and, and believed, as Congressman Richardson said, that there are things that come along that we want to add to it, but is, is that, are we at a point now where we just cannot do that in good conscience when with, a, with the enactment of a balanced budget amendment, which means for certain that there's going to be less money in the future? I mean, can we, can we honestly continue to add to the park system if we can't maintain the park system that we've already got? Uh, Mr. Dix, I think that we've got to make it very, very hard for there to be new additions made to the park system. I think we've got to get the Congress, which tends to be the largest force toward creating new parks. I think we've got to work with the Congress, and uh, we certainly pledge to do that, to establish much tougher criteria for the entrance of new units. There will always be in history a recognition that some places we didn't anticipate belong in the, par in the park system, such as Martin Luther King, such as the Brown versus the Board. Um, I agree generally with uh, Director Kennedy, uh, Congressman. Um, I don't think um, I don't think we should turn our backs on our heritage. I mean, I think most of us in this room have mortgages. We couldn't afford to buy the house out outright, but we had, to, we had to sign on the line for some debt to put a roof over our heads. And I, I think the problem here is that we've got to come up with a financial plan to start gradually attacking the backlog while at the same time judiciously bringing in selected units that meet national significant standards. I serve in the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. We've had to downsize the Defense Department by $100 billion between 85 and 95. It's been a massive effort. We had to, we had to have a base closure commission. We had, to, we had to shut down some units. I mean, are we at the point now, even if all these things were enacted that you've talked about, Roger, all these bills where Congress passed all these things, yep. if we can't s solve the problem, then are we going to have to consider a, a national parks closure commission to take out some of the lower, some of the ones that have very little value. I mean, we're gonna make some tough decisions. I mean, if, we, if we're gonna ruin the, the great jewels, how, I mean, at some point, are we gonna have to face reality here with a $6 billion backlog? I testified last year in favor of the Hefley Vento bill, which is a specific means of addressing this problem. We need to be a lot clearer about the national standards that have got to be met. And I think there should be a heat shield between the Park Service yeah, just, and the Congress that will make it easier for us to have other persons, commission or otherwise, interpose their judgment between the desire to add and the addition. I am strongly for that. The criteria come first. The avoidance of new entries comes second in accordance with those criteria, and it would seem to me logical that you look at what you've got in accordance with the same criteria. Mr. Dix, we, al we also support a, uh, a review of the system. We don't think it's something that shouldn't be done. We think it has to be done right because we do have some outstanding resources in this park system. We would not like to see a closures commission launch just with the idea that we have to unload 50 units. We think what we ought to look at are, are looking at the system to make sure that what we've got in there is what we want. And that gets back to the plan that the Park Service has, which it should be able to come to Congress with and say, this is what our mission is. These are the types of resources we think w that ought to be in it. Do you agree? And if so, let's then look at the system and find out what's missing and what doesn't fit now. We support that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just state, we're going to go continue. We're not going to break for lunch. We're gonna, is that all right with the witnesses? We'll just go straight through and finish this. And thank you, Mr. Dix. You just exonerated me. Uh, well, Mr. Pombo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll try to be brief. Um, first off, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, Thank Mrs. Fleischman for 
what I feel is has been honesty and candor in your presentation here this morning. And one question to you is, I realize that with your previous statement that these reports have been issued in the past and, and you say that they've come to Congress in the past and, and I've only been here for a couple of years, but what happened to them when they got here? Did anybody ever ask questions before? Yes, uh, Mr. Palmer, on occasion people would ask questions. Ultimately, however, I, I think it's very important for people to realize that when the Inspector General issues an audit report, it is primarily the responsibility of the audited entity, in this case the National Park Service, to respond to it and to take a, some form of corrective action to, to alleviate the problem that we have identified in our audit reports. It is not necessarily, I, th I don't think, up to Congress to do that. They're not always able to do that. It's not uh, a problem in the Congress that we're identifying. To the credit of the National Park Service current management, they have responded very positively to our findings of problems both in their financial management system and in other areas of Park Service management. I am hopeful that they are able to change the attitudes overall of the National Park Service for, for career people who will be there after, long after we're gone, for that matter. That is the single most important thing that they can do, I think, as well as respond to current findings. For the Congress, I would, I would say that for the Congress to, to support that would be a good thing. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Kennedy, there's one thing that puzzles me a little bit. There's a lot that puzzles me, but one thing in particular. In, in your statement and, and in the statements of several of the people on the panel, a lot of the problem that exists with the backlog and with, and with really with your problems to correctly run your agency is that we continue to give you more to do, and there's no more money to do that, and you mentioned some of the fe federal mandates that we've placed on you as well as the, the acquisition of parks. It's my recollection on two specific things that happened in California last year with the Desert Protection Act and the Presidio that the service was in favor of the acquisition of the, those two in particular, both of which not only severely impact your land acquisition money, but also impact your, your ongoing maintenance and operation budgets and your personnel budgets as well. Now, I know that one of the biggest problems that, that Congress has as a whole is that they continue to want more and more and more and never really tell anybody no. I, isn't the Park Service a little bit guilty of the same thing and not telling members of Congress no, that we can't take on more? That's a fair comment, sir. I think that the uh, process, the process by which new parks are entered is badly flawed and needs to have a commission or other form that assures you that proposals have been reviewed by citizens that are qualified to conduct that kind of review by training and experience. And that way, you don't have a situation in which the Park Service professionals that have been referred to earlier have a powerful congressperson that uh, is uh, proposing a park and before whom it is very, very tough to resist. Therefore, I agree with you that the process is flawed and, as I said earlier in response to an earlier question, I think it needs to get fixed or at least improved. There aren't any fixes in life. But it needs to be improved. Are you, are you going to present to us an, an outline of what a park should have, or do you want us to come up with that one? Because I'm sure that they would look differently if you did it or if I did it. They might very well look different. It seems to me that's our job. It's in the, uh, it's in the Hefley Vento Bill that we should do that. And obviously then you can do with it what you think appropriate. Well, I think it's up to us to do that. That's why I supported the bill the last time. Will says, you go do it? it just in, in closing, will you at, at least in the ne next couple of years here before we get all this done, 
consider not endorsing every park proposal that comes along? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Before we take, uh, turn to the last uh, member of the appropriations panel, I'll just unanimous consent for any members, uh, I think on both sides, that want to submit co questions for the record that this would be appropriate. I know a couple of our members have uh, made such a request. Mr. Yates. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Roger, uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, most of the questions seem to have occurred around the way uh, your empire is building up. It is an empire. It keeps growing every year as Congress gives you more and more uh, units uh, to uh, administer and to have and to over which to have jurisdiction. Seems to, and, uh, it seems to me that we have just finished uh, giving our attention to an unfunded mandates bill. Uh, we're faced with the same question with your agency. We give you these uh, jobs to do, and we don't give you the money with which to do it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't yet had an opportunity to review your um, reconstruction, your uh, review. Uh, I hope to do so soon. But I've been thinking for some time, shouldn't there be a separation of your two principal areas, uh, the, the natural wonders of the parks and the historic uh, units that you have jurisdiction over, uh, Yellowstone, Yosemite, uh, Zion, the, the beautiful parks in uh, Mr. Hansen's area. Uh, you have the Lincoln Monument, you have the Washington Monument, Independence Hall. Um, now we've got, as Mr. Pambo pointed out, we've got to find the money somewhere to deal with the Presidio and the California Desert, which are huge, uh, are going to take lots of money. And as Mr. Studs pointed out, he'd like a nice park in Boston Harbor. There are a number of the islands there that he'd like to be, have connected with a boat, and I think that would be a very beautiful uh, kind of a park. And then I know of your interest in preserving the battlefields of the uh, war between the states, the Civil War. Uh, and we have just about gotten into that. There are so many battlefields we haven't covered yet. Uh, history. And Mr. Uh, Regula has uh, seen to it that the Taft and the McKinley houses have been reconstructed in the state of Ohio. Uh, history on one side and natural beauty on the other. Should there be a subordinate agency or a branch of yours or another agency that takes care of history uh, and lets you take care of the magnificence of Yellowstone and uh, Yosemite and the other parks? Mr. Yates, I, I've learned over the past decades never to differ with you when I could avoid it. <laughs> but I have to in this instance. I, I, uh, you may have learned not to differ, differ from me, but you've differed from me from time I, to time. I have, time. sir, yeah, from time to time. <laughs> I don't think there is a distinction in American life between the natural and historic areas, except in extreme cases. We have 22,000 historic buildings in the national park system. Some of them are in places like Yosemite and Rocky Mountain National Park. There is a, uh, an interrelationship between human habitation and human creation in big parks and small parks. Let me just give you, uh, and I don't want to belabor this point and we, sh we can respond in writing. The Custis Lee Mansion, which is pretty close to us here, has a patch of old growth behind it a patch of old growth in the valley that is as good a place to talk about what primeval Virginia was as anything in the state. It's just not being used that way yet. So it's real hard to make these distinctions, and I'd like to uh, uh, extend my remarks at considerably greater length with you because I think this is a very important subject. Well, I think it is too, and I hope you will extend your remarks. I think it's, uh, it's a very important subject. And while you're on a, uh, the business of extending your remarks, you might want to extend your remarks on the question of unfunded mandates. Yes, well. sir. I'd like very much to do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Yates. <laughs> Mr. Allard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, I'd like to also express my support the idea where we have both the authorizing committee as well as the uh, uh, reference committee meeting uh, jointly like this. I think it helps both of us to understand these issues much more fully and would encourage uh, both our chairmen to work towards that. Um, the, I have a couple questions. The um, investigator uh, testimony stated that without accurate accounting and sound financial management, the Park Service's ability to identify and marshal its resources to accomplish its mission will be hampered. Now, to me, we're talking more than just balancing the books. We're talking about the fundamental of the ability of the agency to carry out its mission. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Now, uh, I've been listening to your response to the question specifically. Uh, what would you propose to do about it? Specifically, we're going to deliver to you the protocol between us and the Inspector General's office, which states exactly what we're going to do about it and when. That's, that's, an, that's a document of some size. And we're going to deliver that to you. That tells you what gets fixed when and by whom. And it's in that process that I want to welcome your participation. Well, That's you, the first you will deliver it and then enact it? Is that you bet. the assumption? Okay. You bet. All right. I okay. want deadlines, and so do you, and we'll do that. Okay. Um, now, parent, the maintenance of the park facility is certainly an issue of great importance to a lot of the members on this committee. I think that was clear today in a lot of the remarks that we all heard. And certainly when the public visits the park, they expect to have clean restrooms and adequate facilities when they make those visits. Uh, however, as I understand it, um, even if Congress directs the National Park Service to increase their total allocation of maintenance or even earmarks an increase in maintenance for a specific park, the superintendents still have the final say on how those funds actually get spent. Uh, for example, the Inspector General found that the National Park Service diverted maintenance funds for administrative purposes. Uh, do you believe this situation should continue? No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, you don't have any more. Uh, Mr. Vento. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. It's been painful to sit here and to uh, uh, listen to the, the, the questions and the uh, suggestions. I might uh, uh, point out that a lot of these uh, topics, or many of them, had been the subject of previous inquiries. I don't know. I'm sure it's, uh, and I, I think it's a good idea to, to look over, as is being done with regards to the reorganization plan and the accounting uh, systems and scoring systems that exist for the, the Park Service. It's impossible within a short period of time to resolve all the questions that have been, been raised of, uh, of, the, uh, of the testimony before us today. And some of it has actually gone well beyond what and shows um, a closer study is necessary by, I guess, all members to understand. One of the, I think, the, the shock value of the six or seven billion dollar backlog is something that I had tried to talk about earlier in terms of the, the consequences of that. It might be helpful to get new appropriations from Congress. It also, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, is a problem in the sense that it represents a, a whole litany of different uh, issues that are not easily understandable, whether it's a backlog in terms of, of land uh, that uh, is within parks that has been there since they were designated, since the system was, uh, uh, was in fact conceived in 1916, uh, whether it represents unmet needs or maintenance or whether it represents uh, uh, a wish list, as is often the case. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand for all of us and uh, that there is a, a basically a prioritization in terms of many of the projects, the construction projects, they go through a, a, pretty, a pretty extensive analysis of what the construction projects are and the priority and the maintenance and the land. Uh, and uh, very often those are, are rejected uh, by the Appropriations Committee in their wisdom or in their lack of wisdom. <laughs> My, the ch chairman isn't listening to me, but... <laughs> The, uh, and the other part here, I think, that uh, is important to, to state is the sort of the nature in which the Park Service has grew to be what it is today. And I think in, 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 in many instances that has served the nation very well. Obviously, the American 
uh, uh, love affair with, uh, with parks, and as, un as some had explained, the best idea that uh, Americans ever had was the, was the designation development of parks, uh, uh, has uh, had come to be uh, really a, a principle, the way it has been organized is that superintendents had really been sort of the master of that particular area, and uh, we have given them a great deal of autonomy, autonomy so that they have some insulation from political and other decisions that are made, and today I think we're asking them to do something different, uh, something significantly different in the sense of working with the communities around them, working with, uh, with other agencies. In other words, this system, trying to bring this into the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th, 21st century in terms of what we expect them to do. I was uh, uh, concerned about the, you know, obviously one of my goals in terms of not trying to to realistically appraise what the, the backlogs are and the problems are, and I think that's all what all of us would be well served by is realistically appraising this, is that we can then orderly, we can go forth in an orderly manner and deal with the problems and uh, the designations and the responsibilities which we're charged with executing. Uh, the, 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 the issue, of course, of reorganization fits this. As I look at this, obviously I understand an arithmetic or another error in terms of what uh, is present in an accounting system where a fire engine for $133,000 is recognized as one cent. That's, a, that's, a, that's an arithmetic error. I don't think anyone wants that to occur. I think there are more interesting questions in here that relate to housing, relate to entrance fees. And many of these things have been debated for a long, a long time in terms of how we ought to proceed, the, 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 the concession control over the dollars. I mean, some of these are methods when we inadequately finance a park then we find that the park superintendent joins forces with the concessionaire to keep the money in the park and to have them execute and do things. So I think that repair of that policy, or at least giving authority or direction in these instances, uh, shouldn't be and should be accomplished. Uh, and so I look forward to working uh, with them. I think the reorganization plan, in fact, will lend itself to, in fact, uh, resolution of these problems. And if there are, and I think there are basic accounting problems. I think two years ago when we went through the issue of how we had a cutback in terms of what was uh, received from the appropriators. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, we found the assessment process that was going on at that time non-satisfactory. I mean, the issue, and I appreciate the chairman's indulgence, of, you know, sort of closing the Washington Monument or whatever other popular details existed in 1992 in uh, December uh, was a problem for me, and I repeatedly asked the question of how that system worked. and. Uh, the more we pushed at it, the, the mushier it became. So I think it's, uh, I think uh, trying to, this reorganization we ought to go forward with. I, I note that, uh, that the GAO talks about an unusual, talks really and reaches, and I don't really think that the, in many instances of what is being pr proposed, Mr. Duffus, that the Park Service really necessarily has the authority or the direction uh, to do some of the suggestions that you've made, as meritorious as they may be. But, Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired without even answering, asking a sim sim simple question, but I hope I've added to the, uh, the dialogue and uh, understanding and, uh, of this problem. I'll be here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vento. I appreciate it. Mrs. Smith. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to start with Mr. Kennedy first, and if there's enough time for Mrs. Fleshman. Um, I've done some research. I'm obviously new, so you correct me if I'm wrong. And what I'm going to say, I'm really happy to have you do that. Um, I've looked in that over the past 10 years, we've added 30 units to the national park system. And, and it appears that from the testimony, that's what's stretching us. We've just got so much so fast. Now, I wasn't here over the past two years, but in looking at the going through the committee action, it appears that the Clinton administration has endorsed every park proposal to come along that, that we see. Um, and you actually reversed the position of the previous administration on 10 park bills tested to find in support of acquiring them. So it appears that there has not been any, please don't add any more parks coming from the administration or from uh, Park Service. Today, I listened and I've been reading your testimony here patiently trying to see really what was, what was happening. It appears that Nowhere along the line, during the time that you've been here, have you said, stop buying, stop acquiring, because we have these huge backlogs. And in fact, it looks like the backlogs have been understated or 
not intentionally understated, but possibly just totally mismanaged in what was happening out there. Not necessarily your fault, maybe from prior, because of prior audits maybe being ignored. What do you feel is your responsibility to this Congress and someone like me to tell me, um, do you feel there's any responsibility to say, don't acquire more, we've got too much? Or do you only feel when you come to a point of crisis like we're in now, and I'd consider, if I were auditing this as a corporation, as bankrupt, and I would assign a receiver at this point. Mm -hmm. But do you feel you have any responsibility to ever say no, or just to take what the administration, and obviously you're of the administration, as were people before you, and do what they politically tell you to do, and obviously you've carried the water for the administration. What is your personal responsibility, the administration totally, or to be responsible to me and say, too much, I can't manage, we've got too much time to take care of those beautiful parks that are falling apart? I think I do have a responsibility of that kind, Mrs. Smith. There have been two large additions on my watch, California Desert and the Presidio. I'm a believer in both of them. I'm a believer in both of those parks. So while Rainier and Olympic in Washington State are not even able to handle what's coming in, other parks are starting to crumble, you still felt justified in supporting two large acquisitions when you had a backlog. That, may I respond? That, that seems to me a reasonable inquiry. Okay. And, and the answer may be, though it needs to be longer, that in both of those instances, those properties were already in federal hands and costing the taxpayer money anyway. And the, I know there will be other answers, but I, she's asked me a direct question as to my own responsibilities. Absent that, Mrs. Smith, I might not have had the same view personally and would have articulated it. Difference in the, uh, the administration? I might. It didn't arise. Okay. But uh, I think the answer to your question is, does the director of the Park Service have an independent responsibility Congress. to render a judgment? The answer is yes. Okay. It doesn't look like that's happened over the last 10 years. Mrs. Uh, Fleshman, if uh, I, I see as an auditor that you might have had some of the conclusions that I've had, uh, taking a look through this, again, if this was a corporation after even two bad audits, and if I showed we were, showed we were bankrupt, I would have assigned a receiver. Do you think as a receiver you could take this and bring some stability in the reporting back in six months if I were to ask you that as Congress, or as your manager, or as a court? I am hopeful, uh, very hopeful, given the commitment made by this administration in the Department of the Interior, Director Kennedy, Assistant Secretary Frampton, and CFO Cohen, that we will be able to report back to the Congress that substantial progress has been made in alleviating the problems that we have identified in our, our financial management reports, statement reports. What is your timeline? And I realize I'm out of time. I beg your pardon? What is your timeline for receiving uh, back a satisfactory answer? I think that it will take several, frankly, I think it is going to take several years. I would like to say that all the progress, a total fix, if you will, a total repair job and a, a perfectly wonderful accounting system will be online within six months. But frankly, their problems are large. They have things to do that are going to take some time. If they maintain their course, if they stay the course, if they maintain their devotion to this, I am hopeful. My, my best hope is 18 months. But they have got to stay the course. Uh, Mr. Chair, could we have a preliminary report within six months of the, what has happened thus far? 18 months goes into another election, maybe more people, and I think that's the problem. Ten years of bad audits is because we re-elect people every two years and nobody's accountable. We need quicker response than that. I wouldn't accept that answer on that timeline from anybody. No board director would, no judge would, and you would probably assign someone to monitor that. Um, I think that's too long. I'd like to see something within six months maximum, at least showing good faith effort forward. Uh, these problems are big, but I bet we could privatize it and I'd have an answer within six months. 
uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Smith, you will have a, a report within six months. We will be, we continuously audit the, the National Park Service, and we, in fact, will be starting the audit of looking at how and following up on what they're doing to correct the problems. And yes, you will have one within six months. It may not be able to say, I wish it would, be able to, we'd be able to say they had fixed it completely, but we will report to you on their progress. The progress. Absolutely. I think that's satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too want to um, just echo the concerns expressed on both sides of the aisle about the inability to have an auditable financial statement for the last three fiscal years. I don't want to rehash uh, those comments, though. Um, I do uh, want to mention, uh, somewhat parochially, uh, a site in my own district. Um, I have two sites in, uh, in the 6th District in Massachusetts. One site was actually, and ne neither one is really new, one was actually acquired in the 1930s. It's only recently that uh, any funds were requested uh, to, to really make it usable for the public at large. And now it's, it's I would say, about three quarters to 80 percent complete. And yes, with all the demands on the budget, I, I hope to see it through to completion. I know there are incredible demands there. Uh, under the you know guidance, and I don't know who came up with the idea, but um, Chairman Regula last year, we were able to work out uh, an agreement where local private concerns would donate 25 percent uh, of the remaining cost of completing the project, which includes building a replica um, uh, of a, a maritime ship. But that type of approach, while I think it was novel last year, maybe it was the first time it was done, maybe not, I think it's going to be uh, necessary more often in the future where uh, local participation is going to have to be required. Uh, certainly I, I would hope that's going to be looked at uh, in general. Uh, I want to see the Salem Maritime site completed. I think it would be a waste of taxpayer dollars to, to go and, and complete 75 percent of a project and then and not, not see it through. Uh, afterwards, uh, on a wish list, as, as Congressman Studs mentioned, I would like to see the Harbor Islands added as well, um, but obviously, you know, I would like to see us finish one project at a time as we can with very scarce resources. Um, my questions are, are very one general, one specific. Um, I noticed that when uh, I was working to try to secure funds for the completion of the Salem Maritime site, there was approximately a 30 or 32 percent uh, almost administrative overhead charge that went to the Park Service, and I wondered what that money went for because. Uh, I did not see it directly go to the site, and uh, qu the comments I've heard about um, uh, accountability here make me wonder what exactly is that that additional 30 percent used for? Mr. Tarkos, this is Mr. Dennis Galvin, who runs that piece of the Park Service, mm -hmm. and if anybody can answer your question, he can. Thank you. 15 percent goes to supervise the construction project, and 16 percent is maintained for claims and change orders. Mm -hmm. So the 16 percent actually goes into the project. It is bricks and mortar money. Mm -hmm. Fifteen percent is for supervision. Eleven percent of the total project cost is for supervision. Okay. It's to pay people to watch the people who build the government construction. Okay. And if, if there are not, you know, sufficient claim and change orders, uh, is that money somehow reverted to the project or put in it's uh, some kind of general category fund? It is maintained and fund? accounted for project by project. And there are, and in fact, there are congressional controls over moving the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other uh, question that I had uh, dealt with the, the site itself. Last year under this, you know, new approach of asking uh, local people to contribute 25 percent of the cost, uh, we had a, a proposal to phase it in over two years so we would not have a disrupted plan and the added cost that goes with it. I believe the Park Service had committed to make it a, a high priority to complete it. And my question is, did the President include uh, the final funding for it in this year's budget? Uh, the answer is no. Yes, I know. Okay. Uh, could you yeah. offer any insight into that? Uh, we will we'll give you a written response to that, Congressman. Uh, give you the short form, and I'll mm -hmm. try to give you the long form. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, we've gone through everyone at this particular time. Uh, we appreciate your patience and your long suffering here, but uh, if it's okay, we would like to just have a quick other round. There's just a few of us here. Uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you want to have any other questions on your side? I think uh, Mr. Vento and Mr. Skaggs both have a question they'd like to ask. Uh, let's give them each one, or at least one Mr. more question. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, the, the one point I wanted to make is that, uh, Ms. Uh, Fleischman, is that uh, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't find these statements auditable. Uh, and that is, is that, uh, that is not an unusual occurrence with regards to various federal programs. I did a little oversight uh, in, a, in, my, in my other role on the Resolution Trust Corporation, and for years we couldn't audit their statement. I don't know if we can yet. Uh, uh, but uh, the, in saying you cannot audit it, does that imply that there is any wrongdoing in terms of how the monies were expended? No, sir. What that means What did you say? No, sorry, it does not imply that at all, I don't believe. What it means is there is insufficient backup data. They have a, a series of numbers for okay. various so, accounts, and, but, uh, and, and their backup data is insufficient. Well, you, you we said that you went back it. over this, if I could, just because we haven't got much time. I understood that you had the backup data, and I think I'm going to ask some questions about that, but you said this was for the last few years. Did you go any further back than that? I mean, what I'm trying to get at to my colleagues and anyone else is that I think there's been a customary uh, a pattern of use and expenditure in the Park Service. For instance, I did some work in the Forest Service, as my colleagues would recall, and we found out that we would uh, uh, appropriate money for wilderness, and it wasn't being expended on wilderness. It was being expended in administrative costs along the way, if you'd recall. I, I, and it was, uh, it's a concern, and it's the same concern that I think that my appropriator friends would have here, that, uh, that uh, so you really don't, in other words, in three years you looked at this, but is this a matter of superintendents having, for instance, a lot of autonomy, or regional directors having assessment processes that they put in place uh, to pick up dollars? Uh, this sort of thing, or the concession problem that you pointed out, or you pointed out the, the entrance fee issue. I believe you meant entrance fees, not user fees. Uh, we, I remember writing that law with Dick Cheney. I understand the, the tension between myself and Mr. Yates and the appropriators who wanted to spend it the first year rather than wait until it came in. And so the confusion reigns supreme. Is this the sort of problem that we're talking about? You or don't you know all of what the questions I'm asking? <laughs> and would you like to answer them for the record as well as a, a brief answer now? I'd like to give you a brief answer now and, and a longer answer in writing, if I might. You have just cataloged a whole list of problems Not that all. we have identifying yeah. in the Park Service for some years. Long before the Chief Financial Officers Act was passed by the Congress in late 1990. What the audit that I am referring to, the specific audit here, is an audit of a financial statement presented by the National Park Service. That requirement for the service and other federal agencies to produce such a financial statement did not go into legal effect until 1991. And so consequently, they have only had for the last three years to produce such a financial statement. And we are required to go in and audit them. However, they have had longstanding financial management problems. They just continue to show up, and they show up more blatantly in a financial well, statement audit. Well, you know, one of the, our, our colleagues, our new colleagues, asked in six months they'd like to, and you said, oh, in six months you'd have it back. But if one of the requirements is to make an appraisal of uh, the value of an asset, and that's going to have to figure into this uh, calculation, and they don't have the money to pay for the appraisals, that, that information is still going to be a blank space there. It's going to be an unknown, isn't it? Today, I mean, how are they going to reconstruct the concession records and agreements that exist in uh, X number, 100 parks. I mean, I know about the concession agreements. I know they exist, but there's no place that they have them accumulated so that we can see what the agreements are as to what the concessioners are going to do and what the park service is going to do. I think that's one of the problems, Mr. Vento. So, I mean, in six, months, in six months, in all fairness to our, my colleague, she should be appraised of that, shouldn't she? She will be appraised, apprised of the fact that we, they have, hopefully, that they have made progress. I am not going, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think yeah. they will have accomplished everything. Yeah, I have my doubts about whether they will. they will. I have my doubts, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, that whether or not they can reconstruct that or whether we want them to reconstruct that. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think the intention, I think the reorganization here, of course, obviously is, uh, is fair. And one of the other issues, and I don't want this to be missed, is that when they go through the prioritization in terms of maintenance or construction or purchase of land, all of which are tightly controlled by my colleagues on the Appropriations <coughs> Committee, uh, very often they disregard. Is that correct, Director Kennedy, that those priorities are disregarded and others are put in their place? I mean, I can think of a couple of sites that got a lot of dough and uh, they weren't really necessarily the priority, right? That's right, sir. There is occasionally a 
disparity between the two. Of course, I understand in the new regime that all that will change. That this will no <laughs> longer be, this will no longer no longer be the case. The other point, Mr. Chairman, is I thought it was very instructive to talk about the the increases in designation and units and what the cost is, whether it be Great Basin, which I had something to do with. Uh, in other words, upgrading Great Basin from Lehman Caves, again, which was all federal land, I might say. I don't know what the extra cost was versus Lehman, uh, Lehman Caves. We had a visitor center. We may put in some trails and some interpretation. But the, the, the issue is, I think the costs of the, the newly designated units are really small in comparison to the major costs, and that's the increased use, the yes, increased number of visitors, uh, the increased type, type of maintenance. I mean, I think Rainier probably and some of the parks that have been discussed here I wish it were Voyagers, to tell you the truth, have greatly expanded their costs because of just the number of visitors they're trying to meet sure. and meet that need. I might say, and I think, Mr. Chairman, that most of us are great supporters of the Park Service, and we think you've done a great job trying to stretch scarce resources over, a, a, and I think that goes without, that often is not said, and I hope that we can begin to get a better understanding, all of us on the committee, of the work and the tasks that you have and work with you. Uh, to accomplish and achieve the goals that we uh, and expectations we have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Mr. Skaggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have more of an observation or comment than a question at this point. Uh, one is to, again, thank you all for the idea of bringing both the appropriators and authorizers together. I think it's a, a very constructive experience all the way around. I also think uh, a hearing like this is instructive uh, because it reaches back uh, if you will, more than six years in time. Uh, and the, uh, the ability of this group of Congress people to engage in a thorough and informed and I hope constructive for the national interest discussion of this depended upon the experience, the historic perspective, the understanding uh, on this side of the table that simply would not have been present had we been limited to three terms each. <laughs> you won't find a disagreement at this table. Let's take that up as a vote right now. <laughs> right, Ralph? <laughs> well, uh, I just uh, have one question. I want to be very clear that any construction, any land acquisition is a result of a policy enacted by the Congress, either by putting money in an appropriation bill or by authorizing a land acquisition through the, uh, the process of the authorizing committee. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. That is certainly what ought to be the case. And there have been... Uh, I'm, I'm instructed from behind me, and is. I feel that you need an affirmation that that is the case, should be, and will be. I believe that it is as well. But the important thing is that we concur that we should spend money as you want us to. So this, the, this body, the authorizing and the appropriating committees, have a responsibility to make it clear to those of you who represent the executive branch as to exactly how these policies should be implemented. Yes, sir. One last question. Comment was made about paperwork here. And of course, I'm concerned with the increased visitations and the importance of getting m people on the ground to provide good services to the visitors that are coming from Ohio and all over the United States. Is there something we can do that will some way streamline the paperwork, provide the accountability, but not get an inordinate amount of time being spent on paper when it ought to be spent out there helping the people that want to use these facilities. Yes, sir. We have two or three pages of single space things we don't think we should be doing anymore. Some of those, when those subjects come up, somebody responds, yeah, but that's legislatively required. We're going to be coming at you in response to your question with detailed suggestions as to reports and stuff that we don't think produce any change in policy and aren't used by anybody, and we'll be coming to you with that. Have you given this information to the Vice President on his program of reinventing government? Because he appeared before the Republican conference a few uh, days ago, and he had a whole list of things that they're trying to streamline. And are you reaching, uh, working with them also? Yes, sir. That's going through the National Performance Review process. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I think this has been a constructive meeting this morning. I, on behalf of the uh, appropriating subcommittee, I want to thank you for your time and say again we want to work with you to give the people of this nation the best possible service in something they enjoy tremendously. They are the jewels that uh, are loved by the people and we want to make their visits and their uh, understandings and their education experiences as, as uh, constructive as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, you may recall three months ago we asked for a list of things from you folks where all of the requests from Congress that you felt would restrict your work, burdensome, redundant, duplication. I think one of the purposes of many of us is to streamline as many of those things as we can, not make you jump through all the hoops. We could probably save 10 percent of the military budget if we didn't have all of the things that we're constantly asking the Pentagon to do. If you would do that, uh, we look forward to that. You also notice today that the statements from uh, uh, both Mr. Duffus and Fleischman are uh, pretty pointed in some areas. You also got a good feel for both the authorizers and appropriators. Uh, humbling experience, I guess, to come up here. And uh, we do appreciate your candor, your openness. And we, I agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Regula. We want to work with you. We do feel this is probably one of our great national assets. On the other hand, we do want to, the American public wants us to live within our income. And so uh, somehow we've got to work that out. I surely don't want to have a confrontational situation with you folks. Occasionally those things come up, but we would like to work in harmony and compliance and, and good faith. So we'll look forward to that. And let me join with the Mr. Regula in thanking each and every one of you for being here, the excellent witnesses we've got, the people who are in the room. This is kind of a historic thing. I've never seen this done before. But I do think we've plowed some new ground, um, made it easier for all of us to kind of get two different shots at you at the same time, and maybe we can absorb it. We don't have to reinvent the wheel twice. I compliment Mr. Regular for suggesting this. I hope we can do that in the past. Now, Mr. Hayworth has been in and out of the meeting a couple of times. We're including this here now, Mr. Hayworth, but I would feel that we're amiss if we don't give you uh, at least a couple of minutes here. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm very appreciative. And it's also good to see our good friend from Ohio, who also serves in a chairmanship, and our witnesses, the panel of witnesses coming in this morning. Please forgive me from, for having to, uh, to go in and out, but such are the duties I am discovering here in the Congress of the United States. And had a very good meeting with some constituents here just a few moments ago. In that vein, uh, Director Kennedy, I, I very much appreciate uh, uh, what you had to say this morning, I think there are some common threads that I find that uh, regardless of our partisan labels, we can, we can agree with. Uh, having said that, I would very much like to be associated with the remarks of the gentlelady from Idaho because I think she articulates some of the concern reflected in the reports that have been provided to us today. And rather than dealing with a fiscal question per se, uh, some of the questions that come from my constituents are, have to do more with the philosophical nature of our national parks. And uh, Director Kennedy, I, you made a statement earlier that was almost parenthetical in nature, but, but gave me a little cause for concern. Uh, to quote from your uh, remarks uh, about national parks, quote, we must protect them from the visitors. End quote. And, and I can appreciate certainly the wear and tear, if you will, and the infrastructure and all of that. But what concerns me a bit is that, uh, at least in the minds of some of my constituents, and I dare say based on some of the releases I've seen, uh, specifically with the Grand Canyon uh, National Park, there seems to be a philosophy or an intimation in some of the press releases over the summer, we're full, don't come, make other vacation plans. And that just really concerns me. So on the record, I, I just want to know where you, where you folks sure. are coming from. First of all, I ought to withdraw that somewhat stupid uh, parenthesis. Uh, what I was trying to say needed a little more space. We, we're trying to take care of these places, and wear and tear is what I did have in mind, Congressman. Of course, we, we need to be sure that there are, are stanchions up that tell you where you can't go and where you shouldn't go. I did not mean that we want to deny access to our park system to anybody. Now, you and I both know that 
in Voyageurs, we're having reservation systems because there is just so much traffic that some of these places will handle. And I think we, we're going to have to get serious about that, too. My own view is, you asked a personal question, that this isn't so much a matter of people, persons on their feet. It has to do with people in vehicles. And we're going to have to get on with serious transportation planning. That's what I had in mind. I, I'm grateful to you for letting me bail myself out of an inadvertence. Well, Director Kennedy, I certainly do appreciate that. And uh, I just wanted to follow up. And, and I'll be happy to supply for the record some, some uh, uh, news releases from the Park Service, particularly from the Grand Canyon Park, where it seems to be intimated that because it is so full, the, the unspoken message is, let's roll up the welcome mat because sure. we really don't have room for you. And I know that's not the intent. Or at least I want to be rest, I want to rest assured that's not the intent. Mr. Chandler, you have a point? Uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, Congressman, I understand your point, but I, I agree with Director Kennedy and want to reemphasize this. The, the theater is full in some of our national parks, at least at certain times of the year. Uh, Peter, people are waiting in line, they're standing in traffic jams, and I think what the Park Service needs to be about is trying to manage the peak periods better, and sometimes that does mean setting up a reservation system so that when you go there, when your constituents go there, when their relatives and friends come to Arizona, they have a high quality experience coming into that park. Nobody wants to stand in line for two hours for a hamburger. Nobody wants to be in a traffic jam in Cades Cove in the fall in the Smoky Mountains. They could have stayed in Nashville, uh, you know, in rush hour and had the same experience. So, uh, my organization is basically trying to spread the gospel that it's not that we're anti-visitor, far from it. We want visitors to have top quality experiences in the national parks. And that's going to require very delicate and sophisticated planning on the part of the park managers, depending upon the site, the demand at the site, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, we have to have a balance here, is all, I, all that I'm saying. And. Uh, uh, you know, we, we can't just cram 10, 15, 20 million people into one site and not have that park become something less than it could be if fewer people were there. No, I think, I think the point is well taken, Director Chandler. I just, and perhaps a humble suggestion from one who spent his career in broadcasting, maybe the message ought to be this. Uh, not only whether, whether or not reservations prevail, but certainly the welcome mat at different times of the year. For example, uh, yes. the diversity within the state of Arizona, uh, in the 6th District especially, there in the desert where I live, temperatures in the 80s, which I'm sure we'd all enjoy right now. Maybe I could get unanimous consent on that, Mr. Chairman. We'd all enjoy those 80 degree temperatures. But you can go to the canyon and see the snow and see those things. And perhaps the appeal ought to be, and again, I take exception to the chair who talks about the crown jewels of the national park system being in Utah. I happen to think it's in the great state of Arizona, but be that as it may. Uh, uh, the idea that here are our precious resources. Come enjoy them at different times in the year. And I think that positive message needs to be, needs to be sent because contrary to the, uh, the beliefs of some folks uh, uh, in, in the, our political endeavors, I do not believe park should ever become a four-letter word, if you know what I'm saying. And I thank the panel and I thank the chairman. Thank you. Again, thanks to all of you for being here. We appreciate your presence. And this meeting is adjourned. The National Park System includes preserves, monuments, historic sites, seashores, and battlefields. The 367 sites cover about 80 million acres. Every state and territory, except Rhode Island, has a National Park facility. C-SPAN's online guide to government is now available on your personal computer through America Online. It includes photos and biographies of members of Congress, information about how the House and Senate work, and congressional schedules. America Online subscribers use the keyword C-SPAN.
and later on C-SPAN, U.S.-German relations. We'll show you the joint meeting between President Clinton and German Chancellor Helmut Kohl at the White House. That can be seen Friday morning at 6.05 Eastern Time on C-SPAN. C-SPAN programming brings the public policy and political process to students all across the country. Educators interested in using the network as a teaching resource can join our free membership support service, C-SPAN in the Classroom. One benefit of membership is a liberal copyright policy for the use of our programming. Teachers may tape any C-SPAN produced program without prior permission, as long as it's for classroom use only. Also, our coverage of U.S. Congress floor proceedings is available without copyright restrictions. For more information and to receive a copyright certificate, write C-SPAN in the Classroom, 400 North Capitol Street Northwest, Suite 650.